Hey, what's up, my dudes? Devayorn here, bringing you our Baldur's Gate 2 Companion Guide. In this video, we're going to talk about every single character in the game for Baldur's Gate 2. The Baldur's Gate 1 guide will be coming at a later point in time. We're going to talk about a variety of components that I feel should be judged and mentioned for the Companion Guide. We're going to talk about gameplay, how good they are in combat, out of combat, their bants, personality, the writing, their quests, romance if applicable, uh, what their role is in my opinion, and I will also talk about a recommended build and how I think they should be optimally or ideally played. That being said, I want to throw out a bunch of caveats before we get started because people keep asking me about this all the time. Every single companion, just like every single class in this game, is completely 100% Viable. You can play with the shittiest companions in this game, you can play the shittiest class in this game, and you can play it so unoptimally, and you will still be absolutely fine. You're going to have to work harder for it, you're going to have to do a lot more micro for it, and you may have some really hard points at times, and you may have to cheese more than you want to, but it is absolutely doable. So do keep that in mind. Uh, a couple other caveats before we get started, just like all my other videos, this is made in line with the idea in mind that you are playing on no save, no reload, insane difficulty, double damage included, ascension, and SCS installed. We also have the chosen of Syric encounters and a couple other tweaks installed to make the game more challenging and more difficult. So everything I say is going to be in regards to that, however 99% of what I say will also apply to the base game as well. It will just, <coughs> excuse me, end up being a little overkill at times or things that I say are really underpowered and difficult with insane difficulty. SES doesn't really apply to core rules unmodded. For example, we'll be talking later on why fighters with insane SES are quite squishy and need some help while in the core rules unmodded game, Corgan's gonna be able to tank just fine. So like I said, all those caveats and whatnot out of the way, let's go ahead and get started here. So, first character we're going to talk about is Saravok. Saravok is going to be acquired in Throne of Ball. He will join the party at 2.75 million XP, which chances are if you finish Baldur's Gate 2, Shadows of Om, and did even half the quests, is going to be way behind for levels. Which is a big shame. Uh, most characters, um, actually every character, if you summon them or add them or even just had them under leveled, will automatically be boosted to 2.5 million. Saravok comes in at 2.75, so he's got a little bit more XP, which is nice. He is a chaotic evil fighter, human, with a strength score of 18 double O, dexterity of 17, 18 con, 17 int, 10 wisdom, and 15 charisma. One nice thing about Sarabok is he is capable of dual classing. He is able to immediately become a mage or immediately become a thief if you've had some really, really bad luck in Baldur's Gate 2 and no longer have access to thieves because they've all been permanently killed. You can immediately dual class Sarabok into a thief, which will be really useful if you still need to do Watcher's Keep, etc., etc. Same thing goes for mage. You can immediately dual class him to a mage take everybody else out of your party and have them learn every scroll in the game and we did this before and i think we boosted them to about 900,000 xp just shy of a million which is fairly decent considering you know there's still lots of xp to be had in throne of ball so you can get them up quite high that being said you can see right here we're at a melison and saravok only has 4 million xp which means he only got 1.25 so if you go out of your way to do every quest, you can definitely get him up there XP-wise. <clears throat> if you don't, you may end up finding that you don't get to get your fighter levels back at all. And you're stuck as a thief or a mage for the rest of the game. So do keep that in mind if you do decide to dual class the guy. Fighters in general are very versatile, especially dual classing is very, very strong. His stats are pretty fantastic for the most part. You really can't complain here. He's not going to be able to wish without an insight potion, but let's be honest, who is? Um, you're, there's really nothing bad to say about it. It'd be nicer if he had higher con, but who the hell has higher than 18 con anyways, aside from Kagan? All in all, very, very solid shit right here. 
his stat roll i think is actually the highest in the game when it comes to actual companion npcs so that works pretty great as far as his gameplay goes it's quite solid he has a special ability uh called the deathbringer assault every time he hits there's a chance it will do an extra 200 damage which is absolutely massive if you dual class him into a thief and backstab you can have a deathbringer assault proc on it although the deathbringer assault itself won't be multiplied it will just be added so let's say you backstab for 100 damage deathbringer assault hits that does 300 damage total that's pretty damn nasty absolutely absolutely nasty for sure it will also work on melts minute meteors if you dual class him into a mage hit him with improved haste and have him just start machine gunning melts that and proc of that too i don't know why because i'm it doesn't work on other range weapons this is a bug that might have been fixed with uh, the latest version of the ee but it does still work in my testing of it for whatever hilarious reason um but that is going to be it as far as his own special cool shit if you're playing with ascension um there are a couple other bants and other related things that will happen if you give him his sword from the original Baldur's Gate 2, Shadows of Om, the one you acquire in Irenicus's dungeon. It will be buffed into a plus four sword that will drain hit points on hit. Unfortunately, unlike Phobane, um, this will not heal you be beyond your maximum HP, so it's really not that good, which is a shame. Um, also, considering the fact that there are so many good two-handers in Baldur's Gate 2, uh, Throne of Ball especially, it's really, it's kind of kind of irrelevant, to be honest, which is a little sad, because I thought it was going to be something really amazing, and it's not even worth doing anything but selling, which is too bad. Um, as far as his bants go, his bants are great. Uh, Evil Companions as a whole, in my opinion, always had the best banter in the game. Saravok is obviously a very iconic character from Baldur's Gate 1. He will have a lot of banter with the original Baldur's Gate cast. For example, if you're playing with Imwin, uh, Jahira, Minsk, uh, you're going to get a lot of banter between them along the way, which I think is fantastic. And obviously being evil and intelligent, um, they're pretty amusing for the most part uh as far as his personality goes it's just as you expect um he's evil he's psychotic he wants to ascend and now that he can't he wants to help you do it and i respect and really like the fact that my brother is wanting to help me become the next lord of murder i love that if you're interested in one of those weirdos you can also turn him good um, through a series of dialogues which will also change the way he acts in ascension in the final battle um I'll let you guys go and look that up if you are curious. I don't want to go too much about it. Spoiler alert. Um, but yeah, there are some interesting dialogues that can come about because of that. If you are interested in playing good, do keep in mind you can turn him good. I think his writing is pretty great for the most part. Um, there is a couple things I'd like to change. But that being said, he is one of the original you know, Bioware creations. And I think they did a pretty damn good job with his... Um, with his writing uh he does not have any specific quests so he's not gonna have a side quest for you in the middle of nowhere to tell you to go do some shit with some additional writing and banter unlike all the enhanced edition companions unlike a lot of almost every companion from baldur's gate two shadows of on will have side quests erevok does not have any he is also not romanceable so that is just completely out as far as his recommended build and role that really depends on what you need in your party like i said before if you need somebody to be a thief, Saravok can do it. If you need somebody to be a mage, he can do it. If you want to just keep him as a fighter and just keep him as a raw physical damage dealer, that's perfectly fine too. The one thing that is kind of frustrating about Saravok is that since you get him this late in the game, his proficiencies are kind of locked in. He's going to have five points in two-handed swords. He's going to have a couple points in crossbows, uh, two-handed weapon style. I personally recommend that if you do plan on keeping him as a fighter, you start dumping all your points into Halberds. Picking up the Ravager is really fantastic. We didn't do it in this particular playthrough um, because we had a run a long time ago where Saravok ended up killing the main character and we had to start over from scratch because, as you know, the Ravager has a chance to decapitate with no save and that happened. So that is something to keep in mind. However, if you do just want to keep them using two-handed swords, that's perfectly viable. Uh, there are fantastic two-handed swords we'll be talking about in a second. If you want to turn them into a dual-wield fighter, which is really what every fighter should be if they're being played optimally, uh, you kind of can't. Um, you're going to be extremely behind. What's going to end up happening? Of course, my headset's dying. You're going to be extremely behind for a couple of reasons. Um, he starts out... 
Give me two seconds here to plug my headset in. He is going to be at the point where if you... At this stage in Baldur's Gate, you're going to be fighting fire giants. You're going to be fighting a lot of fighters and enemies who are going to be using HLAs. They're going to be using Critical Strike, where they can't miss, and they do double damage if you don't have a helmet. They're going to be using Whirlwind Attack, and their Thacko is going to be less than zero because they're fighter ethos, and then they get Grand Mastery bonuses and Strength bonuses on top of it. And you're going to find that even with some of the best equipment in the game, your fighters are going to get absolutely pummeled this stage. Saravak does not come with hardiness. He still needs some XP before he can actually get it, while everyone else in your party should have had their HLAs a long time ago. Saravok also has zero points in Bastard Swords or Long Swords, which means no Fobane and no Black Razor immediately. And even if you do give it to him, his Thacko isn't bad, obviously. He's a pure fighter. That being said, he is going to miss at times. And so you can't rely on that healing so much. And chances are you already have somebody else in the party who has Defender of East Haven, Nabashi Hide. And all that together means that if Saravok goes into melee against a fire giant, he's probably going to get demolished. And that's just one enemy. God forbid he gets surrounded. So that is something you do have to keep in mind. You can work your way around that over time. If you want, you can dump all your points into Bastard Sword and just level them up by doing Watcher's Keep and some other side quests, etc., etc., and just keep them safe until then. At that point, as long as you have a pure cleric in the party, you can hit them with Regeneration, Big Heals, Greater Restorations when he starts dipping too low, and Hardiness plus Defender of East Haven is going to give him 60% damage reduction, 75% if you do have a Boshi Hide, and that is pretty, you know, pretty good. But that being said... You would be surprised how much fighters take in throwing a ball. It is actually really surprisingly insane just how quickly they drop. I have had games where I have had a character with 200 hit points die in literally 0 0.17 seconds. We, we counted. It was insane. 200 to 0 in less than point, in not even a quarter of a second, they just died instantly. That is something you got to keep in mind. You really, really need damage reduction, and his proficiency points are not going to lend you well to that, so that's something you got to keep in mind. As far as his optimal build, um, this is not optimal in any way, shape, or form. This is just going to give you an idea of what he may look like at this point in time. So as I talked about before, I've given the man a Bashi Hide. This is going to give him some damage reduction, which is great. He has Braces of Blinding Strike to give him an extra improved taste. Gift of Peace, this is something I recommend for pretty much anyone who can wear a helmet. Gives you an extra saving throw and some nice elemental resistance, which is fantastic. I give him the Amulet of Seldarine for some extra saves and MR. He has the Ring of Duplication to give him Mirror Image, which is very, very helpful in keeping him alive. Obviously, we're going to give him a Strength Belt. Fire Giant gives him 22 Strength. You should have Boots of Speed on every single person in your party at this stage of the game. We also have the Sand Thief's Ring giving him invisibility, so when shit gets too hairy, he can dip out very quickly. You'll notice we also have 22 invisibility pots on him. I highly recommend that as well for most of your fighters in general, so if they need to get out of combat, they can relatively quickly and safely. As far as melee weapons go, it's really hard to replace Soul Reaver. This weapon is just so damn good, it's insane. Every single hit gives you a cumulative uh, two-point penalty to the enemy Thacko. This is great for Demogorgon. This is great for Chico really any enemy that has more than 500 hit points. You want to be using Soul Reaver. And there's quite a few in Throne of Ball. Because this will greatly reduce the damage output they have. Uh, we also have Cylon's Blade here for Amusion and Sonic Attacks. This really doesn't matter so much. He should have Chaotic Commands from your Clerics. Uh, you'll see here in just a couple minutes that Vicky has spells for days. And so... This really kind of becomes irrelevant. We have it there just in case. You never know. He might get dispelled and then a chaos comes at him. We also have Graham Sword of Grief, the weapon off Draconis. Or a Bozagal, not Draconis. You know what I'm talking about. Big blue dragon guy. And uh, this is also nice, but still, in my opinion, the best weapon right here is going to be Soul Reaver or the Ravager if you have it. And obviously that depends on the fight you're doing. For example, if you're on a Melisan, Ravager is going to be a lot more useful when you're clearing up the signs. If you're fighting a Melisan herself or one of the other demons or the five, you know, obviously the Soul Reaver is going to be a hell of a lot more useful. There. So it really kind of depends on your situation. And again, these are not the most optimal builds with the best items you can possibly get. I wanted to do this guide with the idea in mind that you are playing with multiple companions. So you're going to have six people every single time. Chances are the best shit is going to be worn by your main character. As you can see here, this is some of the best equipment in the game. I'm wearing Gax, etc., etc. 
and that means you don't have the best items going to Sarabok, and that's gonna that's gonna make a difference. Especially considering, like I said before, Sarabok comes at a really awkward time. He's got some things going for him, like the ability to dual class, but he's going to be pretty behind. He's going to be pretty behind compared to everyone else in your party. He is going to... You're not going to have the option to really customize him as much because you didn't level him up from level 10. You know, if you catch a level 75 Pokemon in the wild, chances are you're not going to like what you see compared to if you had leveled it up from scratch. You know what I mean? That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. All in all, though, I like Saravok. I think he's a fun companion. I think his writing and bants are great. I think, um, especially if you're playing with Ascension, which I definitely recommend. There's a lot of great shit that comes out of that. All in all, I would say Saravok's really a B-plus of a character. Maybe a low A tier. Just because, again, he has the option to dual class, but it's really hard to capitalize on that at this stage. In the game. It's so late in the game... And that really kind of screws him over in a bad way. So all in all, I think Saravox, a solid B+. If you had a character die in Baldur's Gate 2, and you don't know who to replace him with, and you need, you know, a fighter, or you want to just play with him for RP reasons, it's not going to screw your party over at all. You have every chance of beating the game on no save, no reload ascension with this, but do keep in mind that he's not exactly ideal. Coming up next, in my opinion, this is going to come as a shock to a lot of people. I think Animan is the best companion in this game for a variety of different reasons. And we'll talk about that. So, Animan, you can acquire him very early in the Copper Coronet. He is a human fighter dual to cleric. Now, as far as his proficiencies go, Animan apparently did not read the AD&D handbook that says that when you dual class to a cleric, all your weapon proficiencies that are not eligible to be used by a cleric are no longer possible to use. So you'll notice that Animan has points and spears, and the man can't actually use spears. However, had he actually read the manual, he would have known you're not allowed to dual class to a cleric without having higher wisdom score, so I guess it's a good thing he didn't because, you know, you can't do that normally. He has a fairly decent strength score, low dex, decent con. Uh, obviously, that can be boosted through a variety of equipment. I personally, as far as um, proficiency points go, I like to dump all his points into flails and make him into a flail of the ages. The reason I think Animan is so damn strong in Baldur's Gate 2 is because he can fulfill a variety of roles. Now, you'll see a lot of people on the forums, on the internet, saying there is no such thing as a tank in Baldur's Gate. You don't need a tank, you don't need a healer, you don't need blah 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 blah. If you're playing for rules unmodded, I would agree with you. You don't. If you're playing insane SES Ascension, you absolutely need somebody who can absorb fire on the front line, or your party is going to get pounded into oblivion. I have had plenty of games on my stream where everything is going great and then somebody on my front line dies and then my party gets annihilated. This is especially true in Windspear Hills when you're fighting against the Golems. This is also true in Throne of Ball against the Fire Giants and other enemies who love to pop Critical Strike and Greater Whirlwind, etc, etc. Your party can turn into a bloody pulp very, very, very quickly if you don't have somebody capable of absorbing fire on the front lines. Animan is able to fulfill a variety of roles by able to tank. He's able to use Flail the Ages, which I think is absolutely critical for dealing with a variety of enemies, especially Planetars early. They're nearly impossible to beat without Flail the Ages early because they have so many immunities. He is also able to fulfill and take care of your Cleric role, which is very important because you need people to be able to get healed very quickly. He can cast Greater Restoration, Regeneration, all that good stuff. He can tank with Entropy Shield. He can use Divine Protection to tank. He can give himself Holy Power, Recitation, Prayer, Chant, all those goodies, along with Drop on Holy Might to turn in this absolute juggernaut beast of a companion. So you can see right here, he's got 200 hit points from buffs, 25 to 30 damage, negative 14 AC, completely immune to fire, unbuffed, right? Just from equipment. And, it's, and he's using Flail of the Ages with six attacks per round. Like, it's insane. It's insane how good he is. 
Not only is he able to tank with all he's got right now, he's going to be doing great damage, almost on par with Corrigan, who's the highest physical DPS in the game. He's also using Flail the Ages, which is um, extremely important to apply that slow effect to everybody. I mean, like, what more needs to be said? He's just super good from start to finish the game. He's able to do so much. If something happens to Saravok or Edwin, you know, that's the other thing that people always compare him to, right? Is Edwin. Edwin's a great spellcaster. What happens when you when Edwin dies? No problem. Go pick up Nira. Nira is great. Nira scales insanely well. Wild magic is insanely powerful. Nira dies too. Okay, well, you know, they're not going to be as good, but Nali and Imun are also pure mages, and they can still cast Horde Wilting. They can still time stop. They can still wish just fine. They're not going to be as good as Nira, and they're not going to have as many spell slots as Edwin, but they can do it just fine. If Animan dies, there is no replacement. Vicky can be a cleric, sure. And she can tank as well, sure. But she can't do as much with Flail of the Ages because she can't get Grand Mastery like Animan can. He's a dual class. That means he can get five points in any weapon he wants. Vicky can't do that. She's going to be sitting on one APR forever. Two if you're dual wielding, four with improved haste, but that still means only two applications of Flail of the Ages. Aerie can tank great too. Aerie is an amazing tank. And she can use Flail of the Ages as well. But her clerical... Crap is crap because she's a multi-class. She will not have the spell slots needed to take care of the front line. She needs to have more spell slots and she won't have it. Animan does. He does all these things and he does them very well. And like I said, in my opinion, Animan is the best companion in the game. He's extremely versatile, able to fulfill so many roles at the same time and just be absolutely stellar from right when you pick him up all the way to the very end of the game. He just scales great. And you can give him pretty much everything he needs to be great very early, and he only gets better over time. Honestly, 10 out of 10 companion. He is the S-plus rated companion. But let's keep talking about the rest of his stuff. As far as his bants go, they're okay. Um, he doesn't really have nearly as much interesting banter. He actually has a lot more banter with you, believe it or not, at various instances of where he's annoyed about certain things. Um, he is also extremely hypocritical, which is hilarious. I personally love that. Where two seconds, um, is when you walk into the government district, Vicky's about to get burned. He and Keldorn are like, yeah, burn the drow. And then when you save Vicky, he's like, oh my goodness, I had no idea a drow creature could be so striking and beautiful. And he says the same thing for Bodhi. It's hilarious, right? Vampires are evil. Kill them all. Ah, oh, my lady, I had no idea you were such a beautiful vampire. I find that shit hilarious. To each his own, though, a lot of people really get annoyed by Animan, so that is something to keep in mind. If you're one of those people who does not think the smug, stuck-up assholes are hilarious, you'll probably not like his personality so much. I think it's funny as hell, but to each his own. You can also make him fail his trial, which will turn him into an extremely bitter and jaded person, giving him completely different uh, calls and battle which I think is also awesome and hilarious. There are very few instances in RPGs of this time of turning people evil. You almost always have the opportunity to redeem somebody. Very few give you the chance to turn them evil. He doesn't turn really evil. He just turns neutral. But gives some different dialogue, uh, different, gives some uh, different battle calls and commands when you click and select him and tell him to do shit, which I think is cool. Uh, also, being neutral is a huge advantage. Um, we did that this game, I believe. Yeah, he doesn't have his wisdom score. Um, so this makes him immune to uh, Unholy Smite, which is honestly a pretty devastating ability when you're playing on uh, Insane Difficulty. It hits like an absolute truck, and you can see in this party, the only person who's able to get hit by that is Mazzy. And trust me, when she gets hit by it, she takes tons. So my apologies for bonking the microphone here. And uh, that's pretty cool. I like that. I really like that a lot. If you think that he has to fulfill his trial and become Sir Animan, uh, you're wrong. Do keep up. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention this as well. He does have um, conflicts with other people, different conflicts based on his alignment. So do keep that in mind if you do decide to make him fall. And I forgot to mention that about Saravok. I forgot to type, uh, I forgot to mention conflicts. Let me go and make sure I have that written down on my little talk about that. Now, Saravok does have a couple conflicts. I think he has a conflict with Rasad. Generally, he gets along with pretty much everybody because he's such an iconic character, but, you know, Beam Dog's got to be Beam. I'm pretty sure Rasad's the only one, though, that you can't uh, take him with. Maybe Keldorn, too. Honestly, I'm not 100%, but I still think Keldorn's okay with it. I don't remember 100% for sure. I'd recommend looking that up if you're really, really curious, but... 
Uh, so, back to Animan. I personally think his bants are great. I think his writing is okay. I think all his lines kind of make sense for his character. He is a knight after all, but he's also a very stereotypical knight in the sense that he wants to be this source of lawful goodness because he's secretly jealous of Keldor and all the other knights, etc., etc. And I think that plays out very obviously, and I think that's amusing. If you don't like that personality, like I said before, you know, that's something to keep in mind. As far as his romance goes, that is one thing I have never actually done. I have romanced Vicky, Jahira, Eri, and I think Nira, and that's it. And basically what I noticed in Baldur's Gate is that every single person will whine to you about something for hours. Eri will whine about her wings, uh, Jahira will whine about her dead husband, and Vicky will whine about sleeping with everybody on the surface to get away from the law because she's a drow. And eventually, after they whine enough, they'll bang you, and then you're basically married and live happily ever after. Now, I haven't played through Animan's romance. I'm assuming it's similar. I'm assuming he's going to whine about his sister and his dad being drunk, and then after he whines about that enough, he'll eventually sleep with you and you become married and live happily ever after. But don't quote me on that, because I've never actually done it before. So that is uh, something to keep in mind. As far as his optimal build, again, this is not perfect. This is just something that I recommend. I recommend giving him the dex gloves, giving him some extra AC is nice, especially early. Uh, we have the amulet of spell warding here. His saves are a little bit lower than uh, normal because of the dual class. That's something to keep in mind. As always, giving him resistance, helmets, armors, and shields, I think is great. He is basically immune to fire just from equipment alone, which is fantastic. So if protection from fire does get dispelled, you're still able to, you know, basically be immune from a dragon's breath, stray fireballs, etc., etc., which is really important. And incendiary cloud, which hits like an absolute truck at this stage of the game. We also have his holy symbol here, which I think is okay. It's not particularly amazing. Same with Ring of Regeneration. As always, everybody should have Paul's the Cheetah, some generic belt giving them additional armor, and here we have Cloak of Displacement boosting his saves even more. We also have Mace of Disruption here, just in case we end up coming across undead. As far as dual wielding goes on Animan, you absolutely can. I don't think it's all that important, just because when you apply improved haste, your offhand is only going to hit twice. What I really care about is maximizing Flail of the Ages. Since he can't use Belm or Kundane because he's a fighter cleric, this means that you can't actually hit 10 APR with Animan. You're going to be stuck at 6. But even if I gave him, like, say, Defender of East Haven in the offhand, he's still only hitting 6 times with Flail of the Ages. So, it's up to you. Do you want an extra couple attacks per round with an offhand weapon, or do you want the resistances and some extra AC from a shield? It's kind of it's kind of whatever for a fighter cleric. For fighters, I think it's a lot more cut and dry. You want Defender of East Haven, or you want Belm. You don't ever want to use a shield. But for fighter clerics, I think a shield is perfectly, perfectly fine to be honest. Um, like I said before, for conflicts, he is uh, has a problem with Hexat. Pretty much everybody in this game that's above neutral has a problem with Hexad. And let's be honest, who doesn't have a problem with Hexad considering how awful her writing is? So I can't really blame him for that, but that is something to keep in mind. Um, he doesn't really have too many base conflicts in the original game. I think really Hexad's the only one unless you make him fail his trial. And then he'll start having issues with, I believe, Eri and Keldorn. Again, double check that to be sure before you plan out your party. But all in all, Animan is the only character that I'm actually rating S+, plus just because he's so damn good. Like I said, the damage he can put out, the tankiness he has, the ability to fulfill that cleric role by being able to cast every cleric spell that you possibly want. And again, when you cast Holy Power, Righteous Magic, Divine Intervention, he is now completely immune to damage, sitting on a ridiculous stat roll, walking up and just wailing on enemies, beating the shit out of them while taking no damage. And then when you give him shit like Entropy Shield, and he's still able to heal people with greater restoration, heal, regeneration, and Sanctity of Mind, and Archon. I mean, like, he's, he's, a, he's a juggernaut. He's literally the juggernaut in this game. You will be hard-pressed to find another companion that even comes close to his power, with the exception of maybe Nera using Wild Magic. And even then, like... We all know what happens when wild magic fucks up, and it does fuck up at times. Animan is far more consistent. What makes him difficult to use is just early on, he comes with absolute garbage, right? He comes with that shitty shield that gives him protection from normal missiles, which, who gives a shit? Totally useless. Get rid of that crap ASAP. And, you know, people just don't like his personality. I think that's the real reason you don't see Animan used more often. 
Also, I mean, let's be honest, Vicky's a way more cute. Although, to be fair, Anman's a handsome devil, too. So, you can really go either way there. Honestly, though, a stellar companion from start to finish. I don't need to keep wailing on it and explaining why he's so damn good. With Armor of the Faith, Defender of East Haven, you can turn this guy into a tanky son of a bitch so damn quickly, and it didn't combine with the fact that you just get cleric spells for days. And that's why I always tell people, you don't have to make Animan succeed in his trial. Going from 12 to 16 Wisdom is going to give you two extra level 1 spells and two extra level 2 spells. whoop de fucking do He's got 10, and he's only at 5 million, 5.5 million XP. He's not even close to level cap, bro. The clerics just get spells for days in TOB. You don't need extra low-level spells. 21 Wisdom is the benchmark. That's when you get an extra level 5 spell, which is really good early on in Baldur's Gate 2. But you can see right now, we have no problem having extra spells here. We got spells for days. Just keep that in mind. But still, basic companion all around. Can't say enough good things about it. Up next, we have Vicky. Mm, excuse me. Vicky is pretty good. Not quite as good as Animan. She is a pure cleric. Her stat roll is going to be uh, pretty good for dexterity. She has 19, I believe. Pretty shit for strength. And pretty shit for constitution. And that's really the kicker right there. Vicky's con is absolutely atrocious. So you're going to want to give her the belt unless you have a really, really, really good reason to give it to somebody else. The con belt, I should say. As far as weapon proficiencies go, as a pure cleric, it doesn't matter. You're going to be able to put a point in everything long before the end of the game. Vicky does come with a massive amount of magic resistance right out the gate, which is fantastic. Because you can combine that with several other items to make her basically immune to magic. Just straight up. Just flat out that quickly, it's insane. If, for example, we give her Dorn's armor right here, which gives her an extra 15%, if we were to give her the necklace that Animan, or excuse me, that uh, Saravox is using, would give her another 10%, and now Vicky is completely immune to magic. She's at 95 without that other shit. That's insane, honestly. That's really, truly, honestly insane. Super nice to have. I personally like to play Vicky more like a tank character. Um, I feel that her MR is stellar, and due to the fact that for this particular version, you can still use Divine Protection. Vicky can just walk right up into melee. And even if you don't have this, you still have Entropy Shields for days. You still have other boosts that are going to be other spells that can be cast, like Prayer, Recitation, and then the Wizard spells for the um, the other Icewind Dale spells that will further boost your stats in combat, making Vicky very, very hard to hit. Uh, for weapons, I'm currently using Rune Hammer on her. I also have Defender of East Haven for a quick swap near a shield. The Shield of Fire's Call, which gives her resistances in addition to spell turning. Obviously, we have the Girdle of Fortitude to give her some extra con. Cloak of the Sewers for AC. Boost to speed. She has her Holy Symbol of Shar here. Amulet of Power to make sure she has Vocal Eyes. I think this is really great on a Cleric. Um, obviously, if you have Nira in the party or some other super stellar mage, you want to give this them. Give this to them to give them that... Um, Decrease spellcasting time, but giving your cleric vocalize is pretty handy. Although, to be fair, the chances of her getting sounds with her MR is basically... Uh, Gift of Peace, obviously, I already talked about before why that's so great. Hands of Tackhawk, I also think is really nice to have, just because that will then boost your stats to 18. You can then cast to draw upon Holy Might or Righteous Magic, which means you don't need Holy Power, although I still recommend casting it. And just like with Animan, clerics have the ability to boost their stats so damn high even though she doesn't get nearly as many attacks per round as he does because he's an actual fighter dual class so he can get grand mastery in addition to some of that half apr she still hits like a truck 21 to 27 damage is a hell of a lot of damage on one weapon swing you prove taste you give her an offhand instead of a shield now she hits four times around and again look at the thacos here like the thacos are pretty comparable because they're both using holy power drop on holy might and righteous magic so they're really not going to miss ever and they're going to hit like a truck, and that's pretty damn great. That's why clerics are so damn strong late in this game. Um, as an evil cleric, she does have access to destruction. Uh, what is the other stupid spell they get at level 3? Cause medium wounds, unholy blight. That shit's pretty garbage. Destruction's terrible, too. Being a good cleric is far better than being an evil one, unless you're extremely overleveled, in which case you can actually mind control high undead, or even liches for that matter, which is really funny at times, but... The only way you do that is by playing solo or in a smaller party. A smaller party. 
As far as spells go, she's going to be pretty much the same as Animan. Lots of armor of the faith, an occasional sanctuary, remove fear. Drop on holy might is going to be your go-to for level 2. Recitation, remove curse, prayer, chant, uh, holy power, a couple protection from evils. Uh, obviously, uh, death wards, get of commands, a couple righteous magics, one true sight, divine protection, entropy shield, heal, bolt of glory or two. Then level 7 is pretty standard, a buttload of regenerations, greater restorations. Mostly healing spells, couple tank spells, heal spells, and then of course the standard lovey recitation and prayer, the amazing shit you get from Icewind Dale here. That's the shit I really recommend for them. As far as her personality goes, I think it's okay. Personality, I... A lot of people love Vicky. I am one of those of the opinion that I think most of the romances in video games are terrible. And I don't think Baldur's Gate is an exception. I think they're pretty bad. That being said, people love Vicky. Uh, her banter with some of the other party members, especially good party members, is usually amusing. I always like mixing good and evil party members for Max Bants. They always seem to uh, bicker and bite at each other, which I always find really hilarious. As far as actual conflicts go, I'm pretty sure it's just Keldorn and Valigar, assuming you talk to um, a particular NPC. So generally they get along. If you have Hexat in the party, Hexat and Vicky start flirting with each other, which is just fucking weird in my opinion, but you know, whatever makes you happy. Um, it's like I said, her overall role, in my opinion, is to provide cleric support and to be a tanky frontliner. And if you're playing the original Baldur's Gate, the last thing you want to do, core rules unmodded, is send Vicky to the front line. With Insane Ascension SES, Vicky is pretty damn good at it. She's not the best tank, but that massive boost to MR is pretty damn handy. Especially when you consider early on, the things that are going to annihilate your party members are going to be stray lightning bolts, fireballs, um freezing orbs you know acid orbs shit like that and then later on once you start fighting planetars you're going to be worried about firestorm which goes through mr but by then you should have protection from fire up anyways or be giving her equipment to give her her own protection from fire so she's pretty damn good at her job not the best she's not going to be putting out as much damage as animan she's not she can use Whale of the ages but she won't get as many swings as animan her cleric abilities are very much on par with him. They're basically identical in that regard. And she can tank just as well as Anna. So all those things combined, I think she's pretty good. I think she's A tier. Um, her magic resistance definitely helps. If she didn't have that at all, I'd probably drop her down to B tier. But that MR, the fact that there's so many things you can do and play around with that, you can give her the man coat. You can give her a lot of other items that give her MR and just cap that out super, super early, which is really, really fun to play with. Because that's the my big gripe about MR in general is that it's a chance. Even at 95 MR, there's a chance the spell just still goes off, which is stupid, but that's the way the game works. As far as her um, uh, romance goes, we will almost always romance Faconia just because we can. I think it's boring as shit to listen to somebody whine about their past and history, but I guess that's just how the game is coded. So, um, You don't get a baby like you do with Aerie. There are no other romance conflicts like Eri. I think that's really all that needs to be said, to be honest. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but... I mean, I, I've, I've just basically come to accept that the entire community absolutely loves banging their companions, so I guess I got nothing more to say about it. Uh, as far as side quests go, uh, she doesn't have any. Um, Vicky is one of the very few companions in the game that doesn't send you to some far corner of the world for some quest. As far as her writing goes, I think it's perfectly clear. It makes sense. I think it's great, especially once you get to the Underdark, and especially if you take Corgan with her. Obviously, Vicky's going to have a hell of a lot to say in Usnatha, which I think is really cool and interesting. There's a lot of NPCs who have specific dialogues with her, which I think is cool. I mean, not that like they recognize her, but she will say, like, hey, you know, Drow would do this, or Drow would do that. This is where this is, this is where that is, which I think is really cool and really, really fun. And so I do definitely recommend playing with her at least once if you hadn't, especially taking Corgan with her and probably one of your other BG1 NPCs, because obviously she is a BG1 character, and so there's going to be additional bants and writing and crap like that, which I think is fun. All in all, A tier character, great to play with, um, definitely inferior to Animan, but let's be honest, I don't really think there's anybody who is uh, on par with Animan's level in this game. So, great, all in all, 10 out of 10. Well, not 10 out of 10, you know what I mean. Good to solid companion, A tier for sure. Up next is Edwin. Edwin is S tier. Obviously, exceptionally good mage, mostly because his necklace right here, which gives him an extra two wizard spells of every level. And then on top of that, he's a conjurer, so he gets an extra spell of every level, giving him a total of an extra three spells per level compared to your regular basic bitch mage. As far as the stats go, they're decent. He's got 16 con, which is really all that matters 
when it comes to being a mage in this game is dexterity is atrocious at this stage. In BG1, dexterity is important. In BG2, pretty whatever. Unless you plan on mage tanking, and Edwin's not going to be mage tanking. He's going to be spell chucking, obviously. He is one of the best spell slingers in the game. 18 ints, completely irrelevant, does nothing for wizards. He has no wisdom, so he can't wish unless he use insight potions, but let's be honest, nobody in this game is capable of wishing without insight potions, so who the hell gives a shit? His strength is absolute crap, and his charisma is too, but again, who the hell cares? You're not meleeing with him anyway. As far as his gameplay goes, like I said, Edwin's one of the best wizards in the game. Um, he's got spells for absolute days. Uh, we have mostly magic missile and protection with petrification for one. In this particular playthrough, I have a thief. That is backstabbing, so I have a lot of invisibilities memorized. But you can take mirror images, blurs, glitter dust, etc. for days here. A couple of remove magics, protection from fire to buff the party for three. Your standard um, emotions for level four, along with a couple spirit armors and stone skins. Breach, um, lower resistance and spell immunity for five. A ton of imp pace in this party. We're very fighter heavy here for six. And then for seven, we have a couple... Um, Project images for buffing purposes, a couple ruby rays for dispelling. Level 8 is almost always nothing but horrid wiltings and the occasional spell trigger and uh, pure shield. And then level 9, in this particular case, we're about to fight a Melisande, so we have nothing but a wish. Normally we would be taking a couple time stops here, maybe one imprisonment to knock out a planetar really quickly. But at this stage of the game, getting rid of a planetar is no problem for a fighter. Definitely always want to have a chain contingency up as well. Power word kill isn't really that terrible occasionally at certain situations just because you can instantly knock out a wizard or something who just reactivated their spell protections with a contingency of some sort. Spell strike is also great. Um, you know, pretty standard shit for wizards, right? You know what I mean? There's there's really nothing, nothing absolutely, there's no amazing secrets being hidden here. As far as his equipment goes, we currently have Staff the Magi. Obviously, you're going to give that to your wizard. We have Ring of Acuity, a Battleista's passport, just in case his fire protection gets dispelled. We have the Spirit Shield, giving an extra protection of plus two. Obviously, his amulet can't be taken off. Pale Green Ion Stone, entirely for the hit points here. I almost always give this to my mages, unless I'm playing a monk or something, in which case I'll take it for myself. And then, obviously, Robo Vecna for that extra spell casting speed. You can give him additional scrolls if necessary, although we don't have any in his inventory at the moment. Uh, we should actually have the Ion Stone that gives extra spells, but I guess we just didn't feel like giving it to him. His wands go. Uh, the only one that's actually useful at this stage is wand of spell striking. They're all pretty irrelevant, but mostly the equipment you want to give Edwin is just going to be to keep him alive, right? Got to give him maybe a resistance item, something to boost his saves, but really you should be relying on your magic to protect him for the most part. And then if his magic gets dispelled, that's when you really want to have, you know, run away and go and hide and recast some buffs. For example, the AoE Breach spell, uh, the Wish Breach that Kangax and Amelison and a couple of their NPCs will do is particularly nasty. And that's one of the reasons we always give him Battle East's Passport. That way if an Incendiary Cloud... Um, Fireball, or not Fireball, Dragon's Breath, or one of the other level 10 spells goes out, he won't get instantly permanently killed by that. As far as his bants go, I think they're great. I really can't say anything bad about any evil character's banter in this game, assuming it's one of the original cast and not one of the EE characters. Especially if you take uh, some earlier NPCs from BG1, they have a lot of great banter with Edwin. Jahira will mock him constantly, uh, especially once he turns into a woman from his side quest with the... Um, the Nether Scroll, which is obviously fantastic, hilarious dialogue. His gameplay is stellar. He's a fantastic mage from start to finish, scales very well. It, but I also, and something I do want to mention, we will typically take Nira first and then keep Edwin as a backup for a couple reasons. Edwin, because of his necklace and because of his class, will get more spells than a normal mage will. So let's say, for example, Nira's at 5 million XP and dies, and you have to replace her with Edwin, who comes in at 2.5. That's not that big of a loss because Edwin gets so many extra spells anyway, you're not really losing much there aside from the wild match. If the opposite were true, if you had Edwin with like seven level nine spells and you pick up Nira, who now only has two because she's a wild mage, you know, that's, that's pretty painful. But again, that's entirely up to you and what you're doing with your party. Um, like I said, his gameplay is great. He's got spells for days, very handy. He is the only spellcaster in this group right now, which you really can't say that Nalia or Emuin could fulfill that role. Nira, maybe, but considering she's a wild mage, chances are his, her buffs are going to fuck up at some point or accidentally kill you. And that's something that really no other wizard can boast of. Edwin is the only person who can say, I can be the only mage you have in a party, and that is okay. It's not ideal, but 
that is pretty damn good. And really, no other mage can say that because they don't have the slots. And Moen and Nalia do not have the slots, and Nira has more, but she's a wild mage, so every time she casts a spell, she has a chance to kill you with it. That's something to keep in mind. I think his writing is great. Everything he says makes sense from start to finish. Uh, his writing with Nira is absolutely atrocious uh, and makes zero sense. So that is a shame. Uh, you cannot romance Edwin, unfortunately. You can't romance Edwina either, which is beyond me. Because let's be real, that's the romance that everybody was looking forward to. I already showed you the recommend build here. As far as conflicts go, he has problems with Minsk and Keldorn, I believe. Um, I would just, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I am still convinced that Charisma will prevent bad conflicts in this game, for the most part, with the exception of dialogue-triggered NPCs. I have been told by people who have looked at the code that that is not true, but this is a hill that I'm willing to die on, because every single time I play this game with high charisma, I never have a problem. And when I play with low charisma, I always do. So, it's anecdotal, I guess, but something to keep in mind. There are also a couple instances where if you have low charisma, Edwin will leave the party. Um, if you attack Fur Crag and you have like five charisma, Edwin will be like, you're insane, I'm out. So that's something to keep in mind too. If you're one of those people who tanks charisma to one because they think, who cares, it's charisma. Do you keep in mind that Edwin might just leave your party at a random moment because you're too ugly and he just doesn't have faith in ugly people, I guess. I don't know. All in all, though, great companion. Definitely worthy of S tier. Um, I believe the Nether Scroll is his only side quest, now that I think about it. Um, De Garden, we'll talk to him a little bit later on. Unfortunately, you can't take him to Thay, which is a huge shame. I would have loved to have seen Edwin and Thay with Nera. I think Beamdog missed a massive, massive uh, opportunity there. I think that would have been amazingly fun and interesting. But considering how bad their writing is for the most part, maybe it's better that they didn't. Anyways, S tier for Edwin. Great companion all the way. Up next, we have Mazzy. Mazzy is A tier. Mazzy is going to be able to fulfill only one role in the party, which is going to be pumping out physical damage. She cannot tank to save her fucking life. Obviously, she has no magic in any way, shape, or form. She has one job, and that's to shoot shit with her bows. You can go and put points in a short sword, but considering her constitution so crap, and all the work you're going to have to do to make her actually be able to frontline, and the fact that you're giving her Defender of East Haven all these items to keep her, keep her ass alive, and they should be going to a better fighter... It just seems really, really stupid to do so. So, for Mazzy, we have all her points of a short bow, and then we have every additional point thereafter going to crossbows. She is a halfling, a lawful good fighter, who comes with a couple interesting abilities. Yes. Oh, that is really loud. Hang on. Here, one second. Uh, so, Mazzy is able to cast Strength, which will boost her Strength score, but most importantly, this gives you additional Thacko to all attacks, which includes range attacks, lasting for three kind of cool oh fuck oh boy this is awkward enough i have gathered enough essence to deal with you i will wait no longer to end your pathetic life prepare to join your fruit needs experiencing some technological differences here chat so give me just a second my friends ascension am i right omega law all right, so anyways, um, we're paused, right? For the love of God. Okay, she can also lay on hands herself, which gives her two hit points per level, kind of cool. She also has an Invoke Courage ability, which basically is remove fear while also giving Thacko and a bonus to saving throws. Very cool. She can also give herself a haste only to herself, and then that's it. But there's still a couple of fun and interesting abilities there. Her strength score is pretty garbage, 15, dexterity 18, or constitution 16, and that is really tragic. Because she is a beautiful manlet et, which means she does get uh, shorty saving throws, but not that many because she only has 16 con, which really sucks. Her in wisdom and charisma is pretty much irrelevant. As far as uh, equipment goes, short bow guessing is really hard to beat this. Absolutely fantastic short bow. Uh, if you get five points in crossbows, upgrading a fire tooth is definitely better, but short bow guessing is damn fine. And especially if you have somebody else in the party who should be using fire tooth you should just let them have it and just let her use short bow I guess and it'll be okay yes yeah, short bow sort of the mask here along with short sort of avarine but those are pretty irrelevant i don't think we've ever used them once in this entire playthrough nor should you she just does a better job shooting 
As far as equipment goes, I gave her fire control and Battlista's passport, along with the Gorgon plate, making her completely immune to fire whether or not she gets dispelled. Cloak of Reflection, giving her complete immunity to electricity as well. She also has Elves Bane, who really cares? Boots and speed, 50% physical, uh, excuse me, 50% crushing damage reduction. Um, here, in addition to a Amulet of Magic Resistance and a Dale's Protector. Dale's Protector being completely irrelevant. Her Thacko is so good. It doesn't really fucking matter. That being said, um, I mean, like, right now, she is literally unbuffed and at negative 10 Thacko, while everyone else here is buffed and about the same. Range Thacko in the game is just absolutely disgustingly good, so you don't really have to worry about that so much. As far as her gameplay goes, pretty solid uh, physical DPS. Uh, Mazzy's the little machine gunner that everyone loves. Um, she puts out good numbers. She cannot compete with Corrigan. She cannot compete with Animan or uh, one of the other fighters who has very high strength and very high APR. He's capable of putting out some real serious numbers. That being said, Mazzy does put out good damage and she does it from range without you having to worry about her getting hit at all. So that is nice. But you will want somebody in the front line who's capable of tanking so Mazzy can actually do her thing in the back. Obviously, if she gets in the melee, she's going to get destroyed relatively quickly. As far as her bants go, she actually has some decent banter, um, mostly with Corrigan, but with a couple of their NPCs as well, especially the evil NPCs like Edwin and whatnot. She is also voiced by Jennifer Hale, and everyone loves that. Same voice actress who did uh, Basila and KOTOR. Um, I think her writing is okay um, early on. I think it's great, but once she starts doing her side quests, they make zero fucking sense. Her fighting the ogre uh, in the tavern, one of her quests, is just absolutely so out of place and weird. I have no idea where they're going with that originally, but um, what we get is just crap. Excuse me while I enjoy this tasty Mountain Dew here, which is really, really, really strange. Um, yeah, I mean, her other side quest is uh, curing one of her other halfling friends in trade meat. Very, very, very short quest. You literally go next door to the temple, and um, you also talk to one dude, go next door to the temple, kill a guy, take a potion, cure the guy, and it's over and done with, and you never see or hear from them again. Again, I feel like there's a lot of cut content there for her quest, while Edwin's quest feels very complete. Mazzy's feels very unfinished, which is a shame. She's also unromanceable, which is a big shame, because she is by far the most mentally well-adjusted character in this game, male or female. Um, as far as recommended build goes, you already see that. I always recommend giving her guess and her fire tooth or something like that. As far as conflicts go, just like every other lawful good companion, or I should say most, she absolutely hates Hexat, and again, can't blame her. Who likes Hexat? Um, but she gets along with pretty much everybody else, including evil companions. And Corgan as well, who makes a lot of lewd suggestions at her. She kind of, uh, kind of fucking plays around with him too, which I think is really funny. All in all, great companion. Very likable. Um, Mazzy's very, very, very solid pickup if you need some physical DPS. Again, like she, I said, she will not be able to compete with some of the other damage dealers for physical DPS. But she's perfectly decent. And again, she does it all from range, which is really, really nice to have. So you don't have to worry about her getting pounded into paste by a fire giant or a dragon or some shit like that. Good. All in all, A tier companion, definitely not worthy of being S tier, but I don't think she's uh, worse than A tier either. Some of her abilities are actually surprisingly useful. I really like the fact that you can give everybody in your party an extra plus one bonus to saves for five turns. I think that's great. Five minute buff, extra just one Thacko and all saves to everybody, and addition to being immune to fear, that's just great. And again, her strength score giving her extra four Thacko is also really fantastic. Honestly, I think Mazzy's very, very solid. So A tier for sure. Now we're going to go and move on to some other companions here, boys. Give me just a second here. Let's go talk about the EE companions next. That's what we want to do, isn't it? EE companions next. That's what we'll do. Okay. All right. Up next is Dorn. Uh, Dorn, I actually give an A tier rating despite some of the... We'll get into that in a minute. Okay. So Dorn is a Blackguard. Blackguard is going to be an evil paladin, um, which is honestly a shame because, in my opinion, the reason you play a paladin is either you're role-playing or you want the paladin equipment, and Dorn can do neither of those things, which is really, really unfortunate. You can't use Karsamir. You can't use the Purifier. And that's kind of the only thing you get for being a paladin. Hey, look at You compare a paladin to, say, a fighter, for example. A fighter can dual class, a fighter can become a thief or a cleric or a wizard, which ups their power immensely. A fighter can also get Grand Mastery in a weapon, which gives them additional Thacko, gives them additional damage, and most importantly, additional APR. 
Paladins lose that. And what do they get? An extra bonus to small bonus to saves. And you can cast some cleric spells. Cool. Nice. All right. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's great. But you also get access to paladin only equipment. Tarsimir, Purifier, both of those are good weapons. Not amazing weapons, but they're good weapons, especially for swaps. And you can't use that as a black guard. And that really kind of pisses me off, to be honest. I guess it makes sense the Purifier and Tarsimir would not like to be held by an evil paladin, but at the same time, the Beamdog tried to make an evil version of Tarsimir, and the weapon is absolute dog shit, which sucks. So, um... What else do black guards get? So black guards get the ability to poison their weapon, which used to be way better, and people complained that it was incredibly overpowered because in Baldur's Gate 1, enemies will throw up stone skin, and that's it. So you hit them with a poison, and they just get absolutely annihilated, so it got nerfed into the ground. Aura of Despair is actually a very good ability. All enemies will suffer a minus 4 penalty to hit and damage rolls and AC for one turn, and 18 or fewer hit dice are panicked as well with no save. That's actually quite good. We can only cast this once per day. So either you got to rest all the time, which is atrocious and boring and stupid, or you, again, you just have to be very, very careful with its use, which is a shame. And then they also get, um, I believe, true immunity to fear and level drain, right? Yeah, here we go. Level drain and fear. And also they get absorb health instead of lay on hand, which is actually kind of nice. So you walk up to an enemy, hit him with absorb health, which can be used once per day, and it deals two damage per level and uh, gives you um, that HP back, which is, can be useful at times. So as far as his gameplay goes, I typically use Dorn as a semi-fighter Flail the Ages user, typically. In this particular run, I'm using Flail the Ages myself, but if I were not, I would probably be doing this with Doran right here. And this is what I'd be using, almost always. Doran would be using Flail the Ages in the main hand, Defender of East Haven in the off hand. His Silver Dragon Armor, which is a Doran only item that you get from his quest and Throne of Ball, is actually incredibly good. Uh, reduces charisma, but who the hell cares? Its AC is very solid at negative two. Good bonuses for slashing, piercing, and missile. Gives you 15 MR, which is great. Also increases your movement rate, which is actually really nice in Throne of Ball. Being able to reposition in high damaging uh, fights is crucial. And the real kicker here is that heals the wearer two hit points each time damage is taken. This is fantastic. When you're using Defender of East Haven, Hardiness, and Armor of the Faith, you're sitting at 80% plus damage reduction so a hit that would normally do 20 damage is now only doing four and whenever you get hit you heal for two hit points so that two that four is now doing two damage a swing if i have a cleric walk up to you and hit you with regeneration you're actually healing faster than you're taking damage that is pretty damn cool but what makes this ability even weirder is that if somehow you're immune to physical damage, right? Let's say you're um, a Dwarven Defender who's evil, slap this bitch on, pop your defensive stance, Defender of East Haven, your helm and shit. Now you're actually healing every time you get hit, in addition to a regeneration on top of you, assuming your damage reduction is high enough. And that is really, really cool. And again, the fact that you get also great MR and great AC on top of it, it's pretty wild. Really, really wild. As far as the rest of equipment is goes, uh, we have Ring of Earth Control here. Again, I talked about before, this is not optimal equipment. This is based on the idea that you're going to have multiple people in your party, etc., etc. So obviously, I have some of the best equipment. As always, I'm using Ring of Gax. I've got Cloak of the Dark Moon. I've got Ice Star in my offhand to give me fire resistance, etc., etc. So Doran has the Helm of Dumathoin, Amulet of Seldarine. Uh, Brawling Hands is important because his dex to shit. Doran comes with 19 strength, uh, crappy dex, very crappy con, and the rest of his stats are pretty unremarkable and uninteresting. And that's really what makes Doran, in my opinion, not good in BG1 and makes him lackluster in BG2. The reason you take Doran over, say, Valigar, over, say, Corrigan, over, say, Animan, over, say, some of the other companions who are going to be able to do equivalent damage while also ha having a little bit more tankiness is because of his armor or you really like his personality and Doran's personality is it's that is a very specific acquired taste 
I have to say that in my humble opinion, Doran's writing in this game is the worst of all NPCs. And that is a bold statement considering the rest of the companions we have in this particular party here, especially these two towards the bottom. Doran's writing is just, I don't know what the fuck they were smoking when they wrote this character. You actually, unironically, at one point in a conversation with Doran, use the exact words, I am the danger. And I don't know if just Beamdog thought that would be a hilarious reference to Breaking Bad or what, but the dialogue comes across as so ridiculously cringy and painful to read. And to each their own, you know, there I'm sure there are lots of you out there who think Doran is just a super fun, witty, charming companion, and they just love their half work bro to death. And whatever makes you happy, guys, his writing's bad. Yes, it is. As far as gameplay goes, he is pretty damn squishy early on. Um, Corrigan has 150 hit points in Berserking, and Corrigan is squishy, so keep that in mind when you take this man who's going to be sitting at like 100 hit points when you first acquire him. That being said, Dorn, as a Blackguard, still gets access to Paladin spells. So, Armor the Faith, Draw Upon Holy Might, uh, you can use him for backup exaltations, remove paralysis, remove curse. Uh, I have him using Death Wards right now, but he can perfectly find user protection from evil, lesser restoration. Holy Power is completely useless on a Paladin considering the levels you're using it at. He will eventually get high enough to get one or two level 5 and 6 spells if you're using expanded spell progression. We don't have one taken right now. But that does mean Dorn would get access to Divine Protection, which is really, really good. Um, all in all, Dorn is going to be able to put out some fairly decent damage. Uh, just like we had before um, with Animan, Doran's not going to be able to boost himself quite up to his level as far as strength goes. Although, obviously, you can see right now he's got 24 strength because he starts out with 19 and can boost himself with um, Drop on Holy Might. Um, his APR is going to be very similar. He is dual-wielding, however. Um, it's tough to say, really. Doran and Animan are going to be putting out very similar numbers. Corgan's still going to be slightly ahead because he's a true fighter, but Doran's damage is not far behind at all. It's definitely going to be way higher than Vicky's. Um, his tanking ability, if you give him Defender of East Haven, you give him his Silver Dragon Scale, you cast Armor of the Faith and Hardiness on him, his damage reduction is going to be quite high, especially if you supplement that with some elemental resistance items like Fire Protection Rings, maybe the Cloak of Electricity, etc., 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 Dorn will get quite tanky later on, and as long as you have a cleric in the party hitting him with a regeneration, greater restoration at time, you can rely on Dorn to put out some good numbers while also being survivable, which is good. All in all, definitely an A-tier companion, very solid in this slot. He fulfills the damaging role quite well. His tanking ability is definitely not going to be as good as Jahira or um, Herdalise, which we'll talk about here in a bit. But he can definitely off-tank fairly decently, and he will survive as long as he has some backup and support. So, all in all, okay. As far as conflicts go, uh, Keldorn um, has a very serious problem with him for very obvious reasons. Uh, there's a couple other companions who will bitch and moan about Dorn now and then. I think Animan will say something too, assuming he's still lawful good or whatever. But, uh, all in all, it's... He doesn't have that many. He's not nearly as bad as Hexat in that regard. As far as his romance goes, I mean, it is just extremely painful to read. Um, we didn't actually finish his romance because I didn't even know I was romancing him until halfway through the game. He told me he was going to bang me tonight. And yeah, I mean, it's whatever makes you happy, man. I didn't think you could have a worse romance than Aerie, but Thorns is. Anyways, uh, his quest goes, his quests are great. Pretty much every NP, uh, Beamdog NPC gives you fantastic quests, although the writing, again, leaves a hell of a lot to be desired, but the items you get are great. Uh, Doran's uh, first quest in Baldur's Gate 1 will give you Alberwin, which is an amazing bastard sword. Uh, it also gives you an Elven Chain, which is shit, who cares? Baldur's Gate 2, uh, Shadows of Om, you get uh, a helm that everybody loves. I think it's overrated as hell. Um, the Visage, it's okay. I mean, it's not a bad helm if you have a lot of fighters. It's definitely worth picking up and using. But until you get Gift of the Peace or something better. 
But in throwing a ball, the silver dragon armor, and the fact that you get two of them, by the way, because you kill two silver dragons, means if you have Vicky in your party, you can give her silver dragon scale, and Dorn could get silver dragon scale, which is amazing. If you have multiple, uh, I think it only can't be used by good, right? Yeah. So if you're neutral, you can still use the armor, um, which is just really, really, really strong. This armor is fantastic. You'll basically notice that all the EE companions have amazing equipment quests and thrown a ball, so they're definitely, definitely worth doing. Uh, the writing, like I said, leaves a lot to be desired. As far as bants go, there are some okay banners um, for the most part. I think they're still pretty underwhelming compared to the original cast. I think Vicky, Saravok, uh, Corrigan all have, as far as evil companions go, have much more interesting and hilarious banners. Um, Dorn does say something when you're fighting um, Gromnir because they're technically both of the same clan. They both have the same name, Ilkhan, so I guess that could be interesting if you're interested. Um, and again, he's he's pretty solid in combat once he really gets going, but he does need some help early, and it's really dangerous to it's really really dangerous early. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, he can use Mace of Disruption. Uh, right now we have El Brother for the mirror images, and he comes with points and two handed swords, so Soul Reaver is absolutely totally viable on him. But you do gotta watch him like a hawk because unlike some of the other companions of this game, this dude will fucking melt if you're not paying attention. You will absolutely melt if you're not paying attention. So that's something to keep in mind. All in all, I think Doran's a pretty solid character. I don't like his writing. I don't like his personality. It's pretty bad in my opinion. But again, to each his own. If you like that shit, if you like the really over-the-top edgy shit, then you're going to love Doran. He's going to be a great addition to your party. Up next, we have Wilson. Wilson is the only RP tier character I have in this uh, list here. Uh, Wilson was kind of an Easter egg, fun little meme character that you can acquire um, from doing a combination of events with Nira and Rasad's quest. Wilson is incapable of using any items aside from healing potions, which is a big fucking shame and why he's so, like I said, RP tier. His actual class is interesting because he gets all these really nice and useful abilities. You have a chance to stun people and do extra damage. He has a scaling AC, basic regeneration. He automatically dual wields. He has berserking, a couple of different immunities, additional attacks per round, um, but bonuses to strength. It, but the problem is these are just not good enough. Um, not nearly good enough. Even if he had 25 strength, and even, even if this was per round, 6 HP per round, you're going to find that Wilson fucking melts. He absolutely melts. And if you thought Dorn melted with his 100 hit points and 14 con, Wilson is, I mean, a snowball in a 500 degree pizza oven, bro. And it's a snowball that's holding a fucking heating lamp and a hairdryer and is currently using matches to light a tank of gasoline. I mean, it's not going to make it. I have never in my entire life seen somebody die more than Wilson. This uh, particular run was an all enhanced edition companion run, just so we could see all the uh, dialogue and all the quests at one point ages ago. And I gotta tell you, the amount of times I saw Wilson die, I, I, don't, I don't think I can count that high, and I have a math degree. I cannot count that high. And the amount of times he got perma, oh, it's just insane absolutely insane to me um and that's a really really big shame because i think his writing is the best of all the enhanced edition companions uh when he growls he's always says exactly what's on the tip of your tongue when he roars he's always thinking the exact same thing i'm thinking so i have a lot of natural respect for wilson also if you're playing a druid he is romanceable um, his romance is really, really well written, which is surprising considering it's obviously a furry based romance. I'm kidding, by the way. You can't romance Wilson. Sorry to get your hook. Um, he doesn't have a romance. He doesn't have any conflicts. He does not have any side quests. In his writing, Bants are basically non existent because he's a bear. So he doesn't really have much to say. But as far as his gameplay goes, like I said, you're going to have to work really hard to keep Wilson alive. He is going to die constantly. And the most annoying part is that when he dies, he will be bugged out and lose movement speed permanently. We actually had to open up the E Keeper and permanently alter his movement speed on the character sheet. Because for some reason, he has this hidden local or global variable that will disappear once he dies. So he basically... He basically becomes so much slower than every other party that you might as well just fucking reload. 
to never have to deal with it, which is assuming what Bean Dog always did, and that's why this is a problem in the first place. But um, do keep that in mind if you are playing no save, no reload, and you do insist on taking Wilson with you, you will have to EE keeper him some extra movement speed because otherwise he's going to be moving so incredibly slow compared to all your other party members because of that stupid local variable. All in all, the only RP uh, tier companion this entire game. His damage is actually quite decent. His Thacko is quite decent. You can still slap him with an improved haste. He can get uh, Fighter Ethos abilities, so that means he will get hardiness and all that shit. But at the end of the day, it's just not enough to keep him alive, you know? You compare this to this, and it's like night and day difference. Absolutely 100% night and day difference. Keeping Darn alive versus keeping Wilson. So, up next we have Rasad. Rasad is an absolutely a C tier companion. I don't give a shit what anyone says. Don't believe the internet when they tell you that monks are a late game powerhouse. Um, Rasad is C tier all the way. So let's talk about him. So first of all, his stats are some of the worst in the game. Honestly, I think Rasad has quite possibly the worst stat distribution of all time. 16 strength, 16 dex, 14 con, 11 int, 14 wisdom, and 14 charisma. You'll notice that not only does Rasad not have max strength, he also does not have max dexterity, and he also does not have max constitution. The three abilities that are so crucial to playing any fighter ethos in this game, Rasad is lacking in all three departments, which is extremely, extremely painful for a man who also cannot wear armor or helmets to prevent him from getting critically hit. Uh, as far as his bants go and personality, I... Could not care less about Salune. Every time Rasad opens up his mouth to start talking about Salune, I want to punch him in the face. Uh, that being said, some people really like it. Uh, if you are interested in hearing about Salune, there is nobody on the planet who knows more information than Rasad. He will be delighted to enlighten you and share with you his wisdom that he's acquired through decades of being a monk of the Sun Soul Order, worshipping the great, wonderful goddess Salune. Uh, as far as his quests go, his quests are great. His quests have great rewards. The writing is so confusing to me. It's actually insane. In Baldur's Gate 1, you get a strength belt that puts you at 19 strength, which is very handy. In Baldur's Gate 2, you get access to the Ring of uh, Mirror Image, which gives you three charges per day, and the Gemma True Sing, which gives you one True Sing per day, which are both amazing tools, which can be used on almost everybody in the game absolutely fantastic and then if you do his quest and throw in a ball you're given the headband of the devout which gives you permanent bless and confusion uh excuse me confusion immunity and also allows you to use righteous magic once per day only usable by a monk which gives you um extra 10 hp and three strength up to 25 and you also inflict max damage for each successful hit lasting for one turn which is also really useful for a monk considering their weapon damage is one to twenty I mean, if there's ever a class that wanted to use Righteous Magic or Kai as an ability, it's the fucking Monk. That's pretty nice. You can also uh, pick up the uh, Moonlight Walkers, which he has, uh, which gives him an extra 2 AC. He also comes with some gloves, um, which gives a Thacko penalty to people swinging at him. You can also get the Cloak of the Dark Moon, which is also quite nice, giving you uh, protection for magical energy three times a day. His equipment's great. The equipment that he starts with and comes with is pretty useful. Boots that give you an extra just two flat AC is pretty damn nice. Um, and all the items you get from his quests are pretty solid from start to finish. As far as equipping him goes, there's really not much you can do considering he can't use armor. Um, as far as weapons go, I should actually have a weapon in the offhand. I'm not sure why he does. Does not currently. Uh, typically what I like to do as a monk is go and give them an offhand weapon that's a stat stick. Almost always this is going to be something from the Chosen of Syric encounter. Something like Holdfast, for example. Um, Holdfast is going to give you an extra 3 AC for slashing weapons, and you just throw that in the offhand. The main hand Thacko is not going to suffer whatsoever, because at this stage in the game, your Thacko is going to be good enough to hit pretty much anything, so you just want to use a stat stick. It doesn't matter what the damage is of the weapon. You can't use something like Flail of the Ages to apply something really useful, nor do you want to put it in your main hand as like the Answerer, for example, as a monk, because then obviously you're not going to be using your fist. You're going to be doing very little damage while being extremely squishy on top of it. So Holdfast, um, Spelldiver, something that gives you MR, yeah, something like that is really, really solid to go on the offhand there. So that's good. Um, the rest of the equipment is just, you know, your generic uh, boosting for AC, saving throws. We got this, the uh, Gauntlets of Crushing on right now, extra Thacko, extra damage. One thing I do want to mention, if you do have the Chosen of Syric Encounter installed, which I do recommend, 
um, just because it's a really, really fun fight and you get some great items with it. One of the items that drops is Soon's Laurel of Favor. This is an item that gives you an AC bonus, a Charisma bonus, and protects against crits. It can't be usable by evil people, but that means Rasad can use it. And now Rasad is immune to crits, which is really, really fucking useful for a man who has no hit points, 110. I mean, it's, it's a big deal, man. It really is a big deal. So Rasad with hardiness plus uh, Soon's Laurel of Favor actually can not die instantly in combat, which is nice. He is still going to need a babysitter. He is still going to need a cleric at all times to make sure that his face stays pretty. And until you get this item, you cannot ever go toe-to-toe -to -toe with certain enemies. Like, for example, an Adamantite Golem on insane difficulty will hit you for 80 damage with a crit, which is then doubled to 160 on insane damage, on insane difficulty. That means Rasad will take 160 damage from one crit. One hit, just one attack. And the man in throwing a ball has 110 hit points. That's 50 more than his max HP. And this is the problem with the monk class. Even with hardiness, Rasad will almost get one shot without this fucking Laurel of Favor. From just one hit, bro. And enemies love to use Critical Strike and throw in a ball. So they don't give a shit about your armor class. So if anyone tells you, oh, just max armor, boop, 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 my monk never gets hit. You got lucky with your installation and enemies aren't casting Critical Strike a lot. That's all there is to it. If enemies use Crit Strike a lot in your installation, AC don't matter. Critical Strike always hits. And poor guys like Rasad are going to get pounded into a bloody pulp. So you really want to make sure he's got uh, Ring of Duplication. Uh, El Bratha also is really great. The Mirror Midges are really, really solid to help keep his face pretty. But again, you're going to have a Cleric. In this party, I have this Cleric who's watching uh, Rasad like a hawk. Make sure he doesn't explode. You can make this character work. Absolutely. But monks are not a late game powerhouse. They're just not. Uh, he does actually get some mildly interesting and useful abilities. I do have to say that the um, the Sun Soul Ray is actually quite useful, especially for uh, the first half of the game. This will almost always hit, uh, dealing fire damage. Does extra damage against undead, no save, which is quite nice. Uh, he gets Flaming Fist, which do extra fire damage on each hit, 2d6 per hit. Uh, doesn't last very long, only can use well, usable once a day. It's pretty forgettable. The Sun Soul Ray is really the best thing here. He can lay on hands himself once a day. Uh, Greater Sun gives him a fire shield once a day. Uh, Sun Soul Beam actually does a fairly decent AoE burst, but this is not party friendly, so you have to get everybody in your entire fucking party away from him before you actually use this ability, um, which is a damn fucking shame. Oh, or you got to make sure they're protected from fire, I should say, because that works too. Um, but again, that's like... The, the idea of sending your squishiest party member, Rasad, into the middle of a fight while also telling your entire party to stay away so he can use his Sun Soul Beam. It's just a really good way to get your monk permanent, honestly. I have a very low opinion of monks. I love playing them. I'm currently uh, playing one uh, right now. I'm having an absolute blast with it. But these things require a lot of micro. They require a lot of management. you got to watch them like a hawk. And your reward is just the opportunity to kick somebody in the balls, which is cool. I love kicking people in the balls. I love shouting, that's my purse, I don't know you, when I play Rasad. That being said, he's still pretty weak. C tier, 100%. As far as conflicts go, um, he does not have conflicts with EE companions, which is interesting. I'm assuming Beamdog did that on purpose so you can take them all together like you see here. Uh, he will have conflicts with Saravok, which I think I mentioned in Saravok's uh, thing earlier. Um, I think that's actually about it, though. Rasad gets along with pretty much everybody besides Saravok in uh, certain situations with Victonia. If you're doing Rasad's quest, Vicky will have an issue. But um, I don't think they actually start fighting each other. I'm pretty sure Vicky just bails if you're doing Rasad's quest. So that's pretty good. All in all, he's pretty damn weak. I mean, his damage looks good on paper, right? You look at it, you're like, wow, 20 to 39 damage. That hits harder than Animan. Animan can be improved hasted. Rasad can't. Rasad's stuck at full APR forever. Five if you throw a fucking offhand weapon there. You give him an offhand weapon, now he can attack with his offhand too. But like, who cares, man? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, he hits pretty hard, but he's not tanky to save his life. His MR is useful, but you know who else has a fuck ton of magic resistance? Vicky. 
and other companions can get a fairly decent amount too. Uh, magic resistance is a high level ability that others can use, and then you can slap equipment on top of it. I mean, all in all, monks are just not a really well designed class in general. And you can make this character work, but it's going to be tough. You can see the recommended build here. Rasad is apparently romanceable as well. Um, again, I have not made a female character in the Baldur's Gate to romance the male character, so I do apologize for not knowing firsthand how it works. I do know that uh, if you romance any of the EE characters, uh, they are immune to Bodhi grabbing them and dragging them away before her final fight. Um, Dorne will do some... Black Guard shit, Rasad will throw some fire at Bodhi, uh, Nira does wild magic and disappears, and uh, Hexat's already a vampire, so, obviously. At least Hexat's kind of makes sense. But, um, yeah, so that's something to keep in mind. I'm assuming his romance is probably the best of them all, I'll be completely honest, because Rasad doesn't seem to be um, brainless and whiny, like almost every other companion in this game is. So, I would assume his romance is actually pretty decent. Don't know, though. I do know that his quest writing is atrocious. Um, dealing with his brother and shit makes no sense. Nobody in any of his quests ever seems to stay dead. It's like fucking Diablo or Bowser. They just keep coming back no matter how many times they fall into lava and die. It's really, really strange. Uh, I don't personally understand and get it, but whatever. As far as his writing goes, it's fairly cohesive. Although pretty wordy at times. Like I said, I really don't give a fuck about Salune. I don't know why you're telling me about it while I'm in the middle of fighting a dragon. It just seems really out of place, Rasad. If you could shut the fuck up and go and punch the dragon and then run away when the dragon looks at you because you're so goddamn squishy, that would be great. Uh, his personality is, again, I don't really find it offensive. He talks an awful lot about Salune, but I guess that kind of makes sense, honestly. I mean, he's a monk. He's obviously devoted. Totally makes sense. I get that. As far as bants go, he doesn't really have shit for banter, which is really weird to me. I do know that there are a handful of lines that Vicky says during Rasad's quest, but Rasad really doesn't banter with her all that much, which is really weird. They have a couple lines, but I expect it to be a lot more aggressive and a lot more interesting, and it's not. It's really not all that interesting. I'm honestly struggling to think off the top of my head who really banters with Rasad? I think it's literally just a couple lines with Vicky, and that's it. Maybe I'm just drawing a blank. I don't know. But as far as banter goes, Rasad gets really low marks. He doesn't say shit, which is too bad, because I like bants. Bants are always fun. And again, obviously, the gameplay is pretty lackluster. Overall, I give Rasad C tier. Um, he is very weak. His bants are basically non-existent. His quests do give great items. Um, and he doesn't really have a lot of conflicts, but again, his class just really, 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 really hurts him. And then his stats on top of it are just sad, man. Just really, really sad. So that's going to do it for Rasad. Up next, we have everyone's quirky, fun, free-spirited half-elf mage. Hmm. Wild mage, excuse me. So Nira is a wild mage. She has a decent stat roll of 17 dexterity, 14 con, which you already talked about why is so bad. 16 is what you want. Uh, 10 wisdom, 11 charisma, and 11 strength. And when I said decent, I didn't really mean decent. I just mean, you know, her and Rasad are basically identical. They're both shit. They really don't have what you want, which is absolutely tragic. That being said, her class makes up for it big time. Wild mages are on par with berserker mages, just slightly worse in terms of power. But it doesn't take much for them to really get unlocked. In BG1, they're pretty pretty crap, obviously. Um, very early on in Baldur's Gate 2, they're quite dangerous to have. But as soon as you hit 1.5 million, which is not far into Shadows of Om at all, very, very, very early on, they imp acquire Improved Chaos Shield. And from that point on, the Pandora's box is open, and they just become really actual gods, honestly. The way Null's Reckless Dreamer works, it's a level 1 spell that lets you cast any spell in your spellbook, and it automatically has Aura Cleansing, which is Improved Alacrity. So you can Machine Gun Horde Wilting at level 7. If you have it in your spellbook, you can cast it. So let's say you're level 12, um, and you picked up a level 9 scroll. You can learn it, and you can cast it with Reckless Dreamer, even though you haven't even unlocked level 8 spells yet, let alone level 9. That is insanely powerful. You slap her with a potion of insight, and now you can spam level 9 wishes with a level 1 spell 
with permanent improved alacrity built in. You can just machine gun these things out. Machine gun horde wildings out, incendiary clouds, fireballs, lightning bolts, wishes, time stops. Then you can wish to get your spells back and just keep it going. We had a time stop in Thulsa Dune's run that I think lasted a full two minutes of just me dropping spell after spell after spell after spell after spell. When you give them Vecna and Amulet of Power, the power of a wild mage is disgusting. And her stats really don't matter. Low con sucks, but who the hell cares? As far as her equipment goes, uh, she is our primary, really only wizard in this party. Uh, she's got Staff the Magi, which is great, Firetooth. Geminus, which is normally a dog shit ring, is god tier on her. This doubles the amount of level 1 spells you get which will allow her to have 12 level 1 spells. This drops for the uh, Chosen Osiric encounter. Battleista's Passport, we also give her the Barrier Element from the same thing. Blessed Leaf Crown, same thing. Robe of Vecna, obviously to increase her spellcasting time. I think I'm using power right now, yeah. Otherwise, you give Amulet of Power to her too to really capitalize on the power of the Wild Maid. You really can't say enough good things about this. It is so incredibly, devastatingly strong, like I said on par with the best class in the game, which is Berserker Mage. At times, the Wild Mage is better. At times, the Berserker Mage is better. Um, I think the Berserker Mage still has a very teeny slight edge, but Wild Magic is just so freaking strong, it's insane. So, can't say enough good things about her class. As far as conflicts go, you can't play with Edwin, which is a big shame. Having them both in the party, I think there's a tremendous opportunity missed there for banter between them, especially since one of her quests, you go to Thay. I think it would have been so much fun to take Edwin with you, which really sucks that you can't. I don't think she has a conflict with anyone else. Which is nice. As far as her romance goes, it is not nearly as painful as Dorne's, but at the same time, Nira is more mentally well-adjusted. So there's less whininess going on, but there are moments in Nira's quest where you really think to yourself, who talks like this and why on earth would you write this into a video game? Especially once you get to the dog shit part. You'll know what I'm talking about when you get, when you get there. And it really makes you question yourself while you're romancing this character. Um, aside from that, uh, I don't think you get anything special um, for romancing her. I do know you get a bird at some point, but I can't remember if that's part of her quest or if that's because you're romancing her. No, I'm not sure. The bird sells her 100k in uh, Throne of Ball, which is kind of nice. Although, to be fair, you don't need money in Throne of Ball anyways. Who the hell cares? Um, all in all, I don't think the romance is actually that bad, like I said. She doesn't whine nearly as much as the other companions, which is nice. But again, it's pretty weird. Pretty out there. But that, of course, she's a quirky, fun, free spirit, so why wouldn't it be? Her quests are some of the best in the game as far as rewards go. In BG1, you get a stone skin scroll, which is absolutely god tier. In BG2, you get um you get access to the Red Wizard Enclave, which gives you a lot of extra scrolls, many of which are very, very useful because they're a very limited supply, assuming you can access them at all. Uh, you also get a robe that gives you uh, elemental resistance with 20% all. You get a robe with a permanent chaos shield. You also get another robe that gives you 25% magic damage reduction. All in all, these things are okay. The scrolls are really the big hitter. And then most importantly, in Throne of Ball, which we haven't gotten to in this place, uh, you'll be able to get the Thayan Circlet, which is fucking incredible. It gives you a flat 15 extra levels uh, to roll on the Wild Surge table. The way a Wild Surge works in this game, if you're using Reckless Dreamer, they're going to take your level plus your shield, assuming you have one. And then you're going to roll on the Wild Surge table. So let's say... No shield, Reckless Dreamer, you're level 20. You have a 20% chance of your spell going off normally, no hitch, and you have an 80% chance of triggering something on the Wild Search table. If you add Improved Chaos Shield onto it, that's an extra 40 points, which means you now have a 60% chance of casting your spell normally and a 40% chance of getting a roll on the Wild Search table. And don't forget, rolls on the Wild Search table aren't necessarily bad. Some are really strong. Some make the spell cast twice. Some make the spell cast with no saving throw. Sometimes you get to roll multiple times, which allows you to cast multiple times. I've had a Wild Surge uh, quadruple Horde Wilting before, where I cast Horde Wilting once, four of them go off, and the entire screen is covered in smoke, and when it clears, everything around me is dead. And then the Thay and Circlet gives you another 15. So if you're level 20, and you have Improved Chaos Shield and the Thay and Circlet, you now have a 75% chance of casting that spell. Normally, just flat out, it goes off. 
And don't forget, with Robe of Vecna, Amulet of Power, that spell is going off almost instantly, if not instantly. And you have permanent improved alacrity and aura cleansing, which means as soon as the spell's done, you're casting another one. And it could be any spell in your spell book. The cost of one level one spell. Insanely powerful. And God forbid you're max level, by the way. God forbid you're like level 30. In which case, you now have an 85% chance of this working. I think, what, 33 is the max, right? 33, 88% chance of the spell just going off normally. You now have a 12% chance of triggering the Wild Surge table. So basically, 9 times out of 10, the Reckless Yomer just works. And they have a 10% chance of getting the Wild Surge roll. And again, it might not even be a bad one. It might be a good one, bro. It's just, it's so insanely oppressive. So, so insanely oppressively strong. It's incredible. As far as her bants go, she doesn't really have much banter. Her dialogue is really weird. People will ask her about wild magic all the time, and she tries to go off on these tangents and stories like Jan does, and it's not nearly as funny or interesting. But I guess she does have something there, at least. She will talk with your other party members, which is good, way more so than Rasad, who really has none. I think her writing, for the most part, really actually isn't that bad. I think what really kills me for the character is her voice. The voice is just nails on a chalkboard to me. Always has been, always will be, and there's just nothing you can do about it. But as far as companions go, I know this will upset a lot of people. Nira is better than Edwin. She is a better mage. Wild magic is just too damn strong in this game. S-tier companion all the way. A lot of people were thinking Nero is actually going to be the best companion just because wild magic is that damn good. And it is that damn good. I do think that Animan is better, but Nira is damn close, man. Nira is damn close. All in all, very strong S tier character. Definitely worth taking and suffering through her voice in, in dialogue because. Excuse me, good lord. Yeah, very, very, very strong. Very, very, very strong indeed. And finally, for the Enhanced Edition characters, we have Hexad. This is the only character that I'm actually giving B tier uh, for a couple reasons. Mostly because Pure Thieves in this game have a bad reputation. The original Baldur's Gate, uh, Pure Thieves only have one attack per round. Their Thacko is dog shit. And they really don't have much going for them aside from their occasional backstabs. But in Saiyan SES, it makes it even worse because now you're taking double damage. So you go in for a backstab and you got to get the hell out ASAP because you get hit once without a helmet. Like, I mean, you have the same hit points as Rasad, basically, right? You know, and it's dangerous and you really don't do much. And all you're really there for is a trap bitch. You're there to disarm traps and pick locks. And eventually you'll get used in the item and set traps, which are, in fairness, incredibly overpowered. But... You, you kind of have a bad reputation. Chosen of Syric helps out quite a bit by providing an, a lot of additional equipment really designed for thieves, but Hexad can't use some of it, and she can't use some of the best parts of it, which is kind of tragic, to be honest. So Hexad is a thief. She is a vampire thief, so she's incapable of dual classing. She has 20 strength, 20 dex, 14 con, 14 and 12 wisdom, and 18 charisma. If the sun is out or you're a bug, which happens all the time, Hexat will start catching fire and force you to put on her cloak of Dragomir. This will reduce her stats to 14, 16, 14, 12, 10, 14. Very significant drop. There will be plenty of times when you are clearly indoors and forced to wear this stupid fucking cloak because shit coding. And when this happens, this is tragic. But even when that's not the case, she still feels underwhelming as fuck because she is a pure. Shadow Dancers get the spam stealth in combat, in line of sight all the time. Assassins get an extra multiplier. Thief multi-classes or dual classes are going to be hitting way harder. Bounty Hunters get a really cool trap to play with. Hexat is a basic bitch pure thief. And that sucks. She's going to be sitting on one APR. She has 20 strength, but strength isn't multiplied in a backstab. And for me, when I play a thief, what I want to do is stab stuff in the ass. And Hexat kind of sucks at that, which is tragic, to be honest. Really tragic. Uh, on top of that, she has the most conflicts of anybody in the game. 
Uh, Hexet has conflicts with almost every good person. Mazzy, Animan, Keldorn, all these people throw a fit if she's in the party. Again, understandably so. She's obnoxious as hell. Her writing is some of the worst in the game, which is really, really tragic. Her quests also give you absolutely nothing. Uh, she doesn't exist in BG1, so there's nothing there. In Baldur's Gate 2, you get a um, you get a bag of holding, I guess, which is okay. But, I mean, who the hell cares? You have six companions. It's not like you're dying for a bag of holding anyways. I guess it's a convenience quality of life then, but that's it. All the other items you get from her dungeons are trash. And thrown a ball, you actually don't get anything at all, which is kind of a slap in the face considering what the other NPCs get. And it's really tragic. I, I, I feel like there's... If I could... My biggest criticism of Beamdog as a company when it comes to Enhanced Edition and Siege of Dragon Spear is missed opportunities. And Hexet has a lot of missed opportunities. Really, really does. She should have been a Shadow Dancer. She should have been an Assassin. Maybe even a Fighter Thief. Would have made her so much more fun to play. And then, obviously, I still think her writing needs a lot of work, too. Hexet has some of the worst writing in the game. It is so ridiculously cringy and stupid. You just want to murder her right then and there. When I went and did her quest originally, I actually did kill her. And then I went and forced myself to reload and play with her. Because I wanted to kill her. And from a role-playing perspective, I don't understand why anyone wouldn't. If you're lawful good and you find a vampire who murders somebody in front of you and sucks their blood, you're going to kill her because you're lawful good. If you're evil and some vampire does murders one of your companions and then starts shit-talking you, the first thing I'm going to do is fucking murder her. I'm an evil person. I'm going to murder her right then and there. And then if you're neutral, you might go either way. But I'm still assuming it's going to end in murder. So, role-playing perspective, doesn't really make a lot of sense for her to say those stupid shit. But then again, our end score is not that high anyway, right? Yeah, 14 in. Maybe that's why. Um, you can romance her. Female only. I haven't done it. I have heard it is the worst in the game, which is saying something, considering just how bad the other romances are in this game. Uh, as far as her quest goes, we already talked about that. You get to go to some random dungeons doing work for the mysterious L. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but L stands for loser. But um, they're pretty underwhelming. At first glance, you're like, oh, this is really cool. It's a cool Egyptian dungeon, and then you do it, and then you're like, this is pretty underwhelming. Um... Her bands and personality are pretty much non-existent. Um, she has the personality of Mildew. You can try spraying her with, like, Lysol, but all it does is make her dizzy. Um, doesn't really help, unfortunately. Uh, she doesn't really have much bands. Uh, kind of similar with uh, Rasad in that regard. She doesn't really have a lot to say. I heard her romance line, a dialogue, has, like, maybe eight, six or eight lines or something like that. It's really insignificant, which is... I, I don't know. I, I just feel like this companion was just kind of left in the dirt. As far as equipment goes, uh, she's currently using a Bashi Hide, Vendurus' second arm. Vendurus' Lux Stone, which she can use, which is very good from Chosen Aseric. Uh Vendurus' Cloak, which is great, his Ring of Concealment. Pretty much everything that Vendurus drops is great, and she can use it. She can't use his Weapon Silent Death, though, which is by far the best item he drops, which is tragic. She can obviously use the Man Coat, which is nice. Nightwalkers is also fairly decent for additional invisibility. She can use the Rogue's Cowl too, but she cannot use the Barrier Necklace, which is the one that gives you Stone Skin, which is by far the most useful item from that, along with Silent Death, because she has Hexat's Amulet. And this amulet is actually quite strong. It's very similar to Emowyn's Belt. This basically makes it nearly impossible for her to get permanently killed, which is cool. Hexat is immune to permanent death by lightning, electricity, acid, and physical damage. She can still be disintegrated. She can still be petrified, which can then allow her to be disintegrated. But she is immune to pretty much everything else. And that's pretty damn good. That is pretty damn good. So what ends up happening when Hexat dies, she becomes a gaseous uh, cloud, very similar to the other vampires. Like when you kill a vampire in this game, they become a cloud, they retreat to their coffin, and then you go and stake them. Hexat becomes a cloud. She runs to you, who's holding her coffin in her bag of holding. And if she touches you, she will then, the cloud will melt and she'll be dead until she respawns next rest. However, if you give Hexat a command, she can move while in cloud form. And while in cloud form, she is immune to everything in the game. Which is cool. So if Hexat dies, you now have a cloud which will absorb fire, absorb attacks, absorb spells, 
which is basically invulnerable. And we have a couple times on a stream have used this and abused this to great effect where Hexad has literally taken thousands of points of damage and she can because she's an impervious cloud while the rest of our party cleans up and whatever shit show of a fight we're having. And that is hilarious and by far her most interesting and useful feature. But that doesn't really make up for what else you get here. As far as thieves go, you can make a better thief. If you need a thief in your party, you're almost always better off going with Yon, Nali, or Emwin. Every single one of them will not only take care of all of your thieving needs, but they will also be able to um, cast magic as well. Having arcane magic is huge. They also have better bants. They also have better writing. It's hard to find room for Hexet, man. It really is. Unless you're going for a no arcane party, which I absolutely love to play, there's really no reason to take Hexet. She does not bring anything useful. She does not bring anything interesting. Her personality is non-existent, and her bants are basically not there, and her quests are not there. And it's a shame because, again, you're like, oh, it's a vampire companion. It's an evil thief. That sounds cool. Mm. What else does she get? Well, she gets Children of the Night, which gives her a summon, which scales with levels. Let's see how it does in throwing a ball. What do we get? Wow. Four shadows. And that's the high level one, boys. The low level one gives you rats. Medium level one gives you, I shit you not, regular wolves. You know the things in Baldur's Gate 1 that have 10 hit points and do no damage and die instantly? Yeah, that's what you get. She also gets a blood suck, which will drain a small amount of constitution, assuming they fail to save. Whatever. Domination, sure. Very short timer. It's just, it's really lackluster. Really, really underwhelming. And then on top of that, like I said, with how buggy she is, and how often you have to put on her stupid cloak, greatly reducing her strength, it's just... I want to like this character. I want to like all of these characters. I shit you not. I want to love the new companions and characters. Beam Dog just made it really hard, man. Beam Dog made it really, really hard. I think she's very close to being C tier. Honestly, I almost tempted to swap her and Rasad's placement, but considering all the things involved, being able to actually drop traps, which are extremely useful, tanking in Gaseous Cloud, it's tough to say. The fact that you don't have to worry about her getting permed is the big one, honestly. I think that's what really is the selling point for her. Every other person in this game, you have to be very careful with. With Hexat, you don't care. If Hexat dies, so what? Res her up. Take a nap and she comes back. And that on no reload, insane SES ascension is really, really fucking useful. Oh, it's a planetar. Who cares? Send Hexat in to tank it. She cuts her head off, so what? She'll come back somehow because she's a vampire. Doesn't matter. But you gotta be careful. With any other companion, you send them to go you and tank a planetary? What you wanna do with your life. Hank, shut the fuck up. Um, with any other companion, you gotta be really careful. With Hexat, you don't. You can just play like a brainless monkey. And speaking as an American, I love playing like a brainless monkey. Speaking as a North American, honestly. All of North America, we love them. We love playing like brainless monkeys. That's why we're always gonna be fucking last place. And every goddamn gaming competition out there. How's TSM looking this year in League of Legends, boys? They're going to Korea? Gonna, they're gonna finally win one? Not a chance in hell. We're screwed. But, um, yeah, and that's really, really her selling point, in my opinion. The fact that she can't be permanent. But that's it. Not really all that great, honestly. All right. <clears throat> Let's move on to our next batch here. Uh, first up, we have Eri, everyone's favorite wingless waifu. Eri is a cleric mage. She has a dog shit strength score. She's currently being boosted by a belt. Let me take that off so you can see it. It's 10, 17 dex, atrocious constitution of 9, 16 int, 16 wisdom, and 14 charisma. So, being a cleric mage, Eri has the useful ability of being able to cast both cleric spells and both mage spells. I have Aerie as an A-tier companion, not S-tier. And there's a couple reasons for that. A couple reasons. 
Cleric mages, in my opinion, are far weaker than people make them out to be. Here's the reason why. You have five companions in Baldur's Gate. One of them is your main character. So you can only take five companions, right? That's six total. I have found that when playing this game, you want to have one person who can tank. You can have one person who can do cleric shit. You want to have one person who can do magic shit. You want to have one person who can use Foil of the Ages. And then the last two slots, you're going to have to have a thief somewhere. And then that last slot can either be another backup mage, um, probably physical DPS. But yeah. And so what you have is someone here who is not capable of being of your only mage and not capable of being your only cleric because she levels too slowly in both. She does not get level 9 spells until 6 million XP. That is late thrown a ball. That is not any fucking time soon. She doesn't get 7 spells, which means project image, etc, etc. Ruby Ray, until she's sitting on 3 million XP. That is towards the end of Shadows of Om, and that is extremely fucking painful. As far as cleric spells go, you noticed on Animan and Vicky, they got spells for days. This is what Aerie has at 6 million XP. Two level 7 spells. 6 level 6. Her level 5 and below are pretty fun. But this is late in Baldur's Gate, man. Very late. And for level 7, Imp Sanctity of Mind is basically necessary. It's mandatory. You have to have it. And you want Shield of the Archons, and you want Greater Divine Protection. So, you don't have the opportunity to cast Regeneration on party members. You can take a healer too, but that also is going to cut into how many Entropy Shields she can take too. And that is really the crux of the problem with this character. The multi-class makes her good at being backup support, but it makes it impossible for her to be primary. If you take Aerie as your primary cleric and you run multiple fighters, somebody is not getting healed. She does not have the spell slots to take care of your front line. She does not. And by somebody, I mean, in throwing a ball, nobody's getting healed, bro. You better have multiple wizards dropping planetars to cast heals on your front line because they aren't getting it from Aerie, man. She does not have the spell slots for it. And that really, really sucks. Really, really sucks. So why is she still A tier? Because she can tank. The ability to have wizard spells and cleric spells means that Ari can walk up and be immune to fucking everything. With stone skin, mirror image, um, being able to throw a shield in the offhand to give her additional AC, spirit armor, or whatever the hell she wants to use. On top of it, she can use divine intervention. And she can use the level 6 wizard spell, Protection for Magical Weapons, means that Aerie, more so than anyone else in this game, can walk into melee and take zero damage for a very, very long time. With cleric spells and some other equipment, you can boost your strength to decent levels, so she'll always get an auto attack off or two that hits her a decent amount, right? We already talked about before why clerics hit very hard. So she ends up being a fairly good tank. Um, her con still needs work. I highly recommend giving her the Constitution Belt um, to boost it up to um, to 16. You can also, after she's a very high level, use Drop on Holy Might to boost her Constitution up, which will also make a big difference. You can also give her equipment to boost her HP, like uh, Helm of Baldoran, the helm that gives her additional hit points. She can also use Holy Power and Righteous Magic, which are also quite useful to give her additional hit points here as well. Because don't forget, Holy Power gives you HP, and once you hit level 20 in a cleric, this basically gives you an extra 20 hit points, which is quite nice, and lasts for 20 rounds. Between Shield of the Archons, Spell Immunity, um, Impervious Sanctity of Mind, uh, Chaotic Commands, all these goodies, Aerie is able to become really, really solid as a tank, and she's able to support you as a backup cleric and a backup wizard. Let's say you have Nera as your main spell chucker. Aerie is able to take nothing but protection from fire for level 3 because her spell damages. Her level 3 spells aren't going to be used defensively because they're not going to hit for shit. She's a multi-class, so she can go and buff the party, and then Nira can focus entirely on using Melfs or uh, Skull Traps or whatever the hell you want for level 3. Remove magic for that matter. So that's pretty damn nice and pretty damn useful. And for that reason, Aerie fits into a fairly decent amount of party compositions fairly well. But like I said... Can't rely on her as the only spellcaster for either divine or arcane 
She also does zero fucking damage because of her APR. Obviously, her strength is going to be very high, so just like Vicky, she will hit hard, but her attacks per round are going to be basically non-existent. Again, you can give her Flail the Ages, too, but she's not going to have nearly as much APR as Animan, and so for that reason, she's definitely A tier. As far as equipment goes, you can really give her whatever the hell you want. A lot of this shit doesn't matter. If you have Vecna and are able to give it to Aerie, that is pretty damn exceptional. Because that will boost her cleric spells uh, casting speed in addition to uh, arcane spells. And once you get to the level where you do get improved alacrity, you're able to basically machine gun out those cleric buffs, which is really, really cool and really useful to do mid-fight, especially on long fights like a Melisande or some of the other uh, nastier fights and later throwing a ball. Um, I'm giving her Gift of Peace for the extra resistances, Dark Steel, Grid of Hell Giant Strength for some extra strength, your random ring of protection, Rune Hammer is a perfectly great main hand. Really doesn't matter what you want to give her though in that regard. Whatever equipment you have based on your other party members, obviously you can go and filter that shit in here. Like I said though, if you're able to give her Vecna and Amulet of Power, do so, it will work a treat. But if you have Nero or Edwin or honestly even Imwin or Nalia, they should be getting that shit. Honestly. As far as conflicts go, Aerie has conflicts with Corrigan and Shadows of Om. I have never once had this happen to me with High Charisma. We talked about this before. Um, she will have an option with an, uh, uh, a problem with Animan, assuming you fail his trial. And I think that's pretty much it. Aerie gets along with pretty much everyone else for the most part. Might be wrong. Might have a problem with Hexat. Who knows? Um, as far as her romance go, I think Aerie is the whiniest companion in this game. She will whine about her wings from start to finish and how awful it is being down on the ground with you people and not being able to fly, which is hilarious. But um, also you can get cucked by Herod Elise if he's in the party. If Herod Elise is in the party and you haven't progressed further enough in Aerie's relationship, what will end up happen happening is Aerie will be forced to choose between you or Herod Elise, which means either Herod Elise is going to leave the party forever or Ari is going to leave the party forever. You can't have it both ways. So if you want to take care of Elise in your party and you want to bang Ari, you need to progress her really far in the relationship before you pick him up. Or you can pick him up and throw in a ball and then you can get around it that way. Ari is the only person in the game who will actually give you a child and you get literally a baby that you can stick in your fucking inventory, which is hilarious to me. Um, you can also put it in the bag of holding, of course like all the other corpses you pick up in this game, which is hilarious. So a lot of people like to do that. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for the romance, to be honest. Uh, as far as her quests go, uh, they're really not... She doesn't really have anything. Uh, there will be a messenger along the way at some point telling her to go see Quail, who tells her to go do Herdelise's quest to save Herdelise. Obviously, it wants to start that relationship between the two of them. As far as the writing goes, I gotta tell you, I can't stand her writing. I think her personality is whiny and weak and boring she'll eventually become a little more strong-willed and backboned in thrown a ball but not nearly as much of a transformation as nalia on top of it and this is painful for me to say but i think the writing and dialogue she has with hair is on par with doran's it is so painful and cringy to read they start acting and reading off plays and theater shit together and it is just it is extremely painful. It would be extremely painful for you to read all of it, my friend. It is bad. That being said, if you like a lot of dialogue, Aerie has a fairly decent amount. Um, evil people and uh, people like Jahira like to pick on her all the time, which is great, giving you a lot of extra banter and interesting conversation. Uh, Aerie and Edwin will have some funny moments as well, especially when he becomes Edwina. Basically, every female in the game will make fun of Edwin when he becomes Edwina, and Aerie's especially is also pretty good. Um, her bants are pretty much non-existent. A lot of people will pick on her, but she won't go pick on other people. Um, she has some decent lines with Corrigan and uh, Throne of Ball. In Baldur's Gate 2, it's mostly, just, just leave me alone, boop, 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 you mean old bully. Everyone likes to bully Ari, I guess, really, is the end of it. So, at the end of the day, her class, I personally feel, makes her a great secondary character, but not a good, okay, I'll just flat out say it. She is a bad main mage and a bad main cleric. You're going to have a lot of problems if you're relying on her to be your only spellcaster for Arcane or Divine. If you already have another wizard and you already have another cleric, Aerie will fit into the party quite well. Assuming you have her in that tank position, she will do very, very good at that. But 
that's pretty much it, honestly, for her. And there are better tanks. And we'll be talking about those soon enough. So all in all, A tier for Aerie. She's decent. Um, you do have to watch your spells very closely because she is a multi-class, so they will wear off sooner than other people in the party. I can tell you right now, despite Aerie being a good tank, I think Aerie has died in my runs more than anyone else. I will just forget that her ship wears off too quickly, and all it takes is one spell thrown at her when you're not ready with this 9 con, and that is a dead of Ariel, my dudes. But as long as you keep an eye on her protections, and you keep her casting them as needed, Aerie can tank potentially longer than anyone else in the game with the exception of maybe Jahira, which we'll talk about in just a minute here. So that's going to do it for Aerie. I think I covered everything there. Conflicts, her role as a tank, her build, romance, quest, right? Personality. Up next, we have everyone's favorite father of the year, Cern. Cern is a shapeshifter, so he is a druid that is incapable of using armor, and he instead will be able to use um, a greater wolfware a transformation, which is buffed tremendously in SCS. Um, it becomes a very good defensive option. Offensively, this is still basically shit. We talked about this in the class guide quite a bit. You get a lot of really great defenses, and on paper, the damage looks good too, but the fact that your base stack goes unmodified means that you basically whiff every single fucking attack you have. But your defenses are great. You get a good bonus to AC, you get a lot of elemental resistances, you get some magic resistance too. All of that scales with gear on top of it, which is nice. He still gets the Earth Elemental and Fire Elemental transformation, which are both excellent. But you can't really use a lot of equipment here, and you'll notice that he is pretty bare bones for the most part. Because what ends up happening is you cast a spell, and then you go sit in a werewolf form for the rest of the time. I do not recommend installing the component allowing you to cast in greater werewolf form. I think that's way too strong. But it is what it is. Um, as for his spells and recommended build, uh, pure druids are just exceptionally good in this game. They just are. Oh, I forgot to mention he is A tier in my opinion, by the way. A tier rating for some. Creeping Doom is just fucking incredible. An unnerfed, unmodded version of this game. This is the most broken spell bar none. Nothing comes remotely close to me able to compare. And that includes Improved Alacrity, that includes Dragon's Breath, that includes Horde Wilting, that includes every spell in the game. Creeping Doom is the most busted. You cast this spell and you automatically win the fight, period. It has been nerfed appropriately at SCS, but it is still very, very good. Still recommend taking an Insanity of Mind because it lasts for so long and protects against uh, spell uh, breaches and giving you quite a few immunities. Nature's Beauty is also nice. Shield of the Archons is good for level 6. We have a couple Entropy Shields. Horde Wilting, excuse me, um, Dolores Decay. And uh, of course, Summon Bears because Bears are great. You can also take a healer too as well. Level 5, mostly Iron Skin and Insect Plague. Level 4, we have a couple smashing waves. And then everything under level 4 is basically fucking irrelevant, to be honest. So, if you think of CERN as a offensive spellcaster, he does that job well. Creeping Doom, Insect Plague, very, very powerful. He is also capable of taking a few hits between Stone Skin and, excuse me, Iron Skin and the uh, Greater Werewolf token. He is going to be very, very tanky in that regard. Uh, you can still give him additional items to increase his AC and shit. He's got a cloak who comes with one AC and one save. Uh, you can also give him the stick that gives him extra spells, but do keep in mind as soon as you equip the werewolf token, those extra spells disappear until you rest, which is stupid as hell in my opinion, but that's the way his game is coded. I would recommend giving him whatever MR items you can afford, whatever elemental resistance equipment you can afford to give him, and that combined with this greater werewolf token will basically mean that you don't have to worry about him getting ever hit by a Dragon's Breath or Incendiary Cloud or anything like that and getting killed, which is really, really nice. As far as combat goes, he is basically fucking useless. Unless you give him the Earth Elemental token, he is never going to land a hit. And even if he did, it would do decent damage, but not nearly as much as some of the other casters in this game. Don't forget, he can also still cast Righteous Magic, which then combined with the Earth Elemental token, hits for an enormous amount of damage. So if you cast Righteous Magic and you will hit for 35 every single swing, you could still give him Case, giving them 4 APR, which is nice. But do keep in mind, unlike Jihiro, who we'll talk about in a minute, uh, he is not going to be nearly as tanky. So he has this weird role, and you'll see this is, becomes very commonplace once we get to some of the other companions, where he is not a tank, he is not your only arcane wizard, he is not your only cleric, he is not your only damage dealer, because he's kind of just a step down at each of these. So he can tank, okay, 
He can deal damage okay once he gets the Earth Elemental token. And his spells are pretty good once he gets him. But they're not great. He doesn't excel at anything. And that's really the issue that you'll see with a lot of companions. And why certain companions end up getting rated so poorly compared to others. I wouldn't say so poorly, it's just a step down, you know what I mean? Being really good at tanking, being really good at being an offensive spellcaster, having a really good array of cleric spells, doing really good physical damage, and just doing one of those things is better than being okay at multiple things. And that's really the problem and the crux of the issue when it comes to building a party composition for BG2, no reload, SES ascension, blah, 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 blah. Everything is viable. The most mishmash party of garbage is viable, but you're gonna have more issues along down the road. If you try to take Cerned, you still need a cleric. Well, you don't need anything. You still want a cleric. You still want a tank, and you still want an arcane dealer, and you still want a thief, and you still want somebody you can use for all the ages. That's five things. And then what about your main character, bro? You know, you, you just, you find, a, you find it really hard to fit him into parties, which is a shame. As far as conflicts go, I don't think CERN has conflicts with anybody, like in the entire game. He just doesn't give a shit. Um, as far as his recommended build, we already talked about that, just give him whatever elemental resistance shit you can. Um, that's really it. Uh, you cannot romance uh, CERN. His quest is actually interesting. He basically... Um, left a child that he didn't know about in the city, and uh, despite what chat thinks, we have this conversation all the time on stream, I don't think he did it on purpose, he just didn't truly know because she didn't tell him about it, and so that is an interesting quest, the discovery. I think his writing is actually fairly appropriate. Cern seems way more like the balance kind of guy than Jahira. Jahira really seems like the neutral good, you know, dummy mommy character, while Cern actually seems to care about nature and the balance itself he does actually have some decent banter not only with jihira but with other companions which i really really like and his gameplay is okay like i said he's kind of inferior to a lot of other classes for a lot of other reasons but he is a perfectly acceptable perfectly fine companion if you play him for what he is if you pick up cern and expect him to fucking aoe shit down instantly and be this absolute juggernaut tank if, if you don't expect cern to do things he can't do and expect him to do what he can do, which is be a decent off tank, put out a lot of insects, which are very, very good at what they're doing. He can do that better than anyone else can. And so that's nice. But keep that in mind when you're picking him up. And also keep in mind that you can't give him armor, which is a big fucking shame. Because giving him some elemental resistance armor would be really, really handy. Up next, we have everyone's favorite stuck stepsister who's currently stuck in Spellhold and needs Step Bro to help get her unstuck. And that is Imowen. Imowen has a decent stat roll of uh, 11 strength, 18 dex. It says 19, that's because of Ascension. She has good constitution, one of the very few companions who actually has max hit points per level. Uh, decent int, which allowed her to dual class into a wizard. 11 uh, wisdom and 16 charisma. Uh, if you're playing with Ascension, Imowen does get some additional benefits for being a ball spawn, which is interesting. I typically build her and Nalia almost the exact same way. I actually kind of wish I had them right next to each other because they're pretty much the exact same thing, honestly. They are a thief who is dueled to a wizard. Uh, I will typically give them short bow of Gessen or something of that nature, maybe a dagger or something to do some backstabs with. As for actual armors and weapons, you still want to do the same thing. You want to give them resistance equipment, whatever you got from the Chosen of Cyric, you definitely want to hook them up with. Uh, boots of Speed right here. Uh, whatever resistance belt you have, whatever rings you have. If you don't have a main spellcaster, you can absolutely give her Ring of Acuity or one of the other wizarding rings. You can give her Amulet of Power and Vecna if she's your primary wizard, and she absolutely can be. She's... Oh, mighty. Excuse me, boys. She's just not going to be as good as Mira or Edwin is, but she can absolutely fulfill the role of primary wizard, but I would recommend taking a secondary backup wizard with her um, as well, if you can. She can take care of all your thieving issues with open locks and fine traps. She is unable to set traps. Um, she will not get the legendary traps, excuse me, high level ability traps, which are really nice. Nor should be able to detect illusions, which is also really nice. And her backstab is a times three, which isn't amazing, but it's actually not that terrible considering the fact 
that she is also a wizard who is capable of getting level 9 spells at a very reasonable item level. So you can give her Mordecai and Force Blade at level 7, you can give her Black Blade of Disaster at level 9, and as long as you're giving her Mirror Image, Stone Skin, Improved Taste, all the other typical mage goodies, she can walk up and backstab shit and deal a decent amount of damage. Nothing to write home about. Time, but times 3 and Black Blade of Disaster is going to be a pretty damn decent hit, so you can backstab and then immediately cast a spell afterwards, and she can be pretty aggressive and pretty fun to play in that regard. As far as her conflicts, uh, Imwen is also one of the few who has literally zero conflicts, which is nice. Her primary role is going to be an offensive spellcaster, although you can absolutely make her defensive. Any pure wizard in this game can easily be turned into a mage tank, and she can, no problem at all. Um, she is currently unromanceable, which is ridiculous. I don't understand why you can't romance your siblings in this game. That's just really weird, although there is a mod for that, although I've heard it's absolutely disgusting, so... That's on you if you're interested in such a thing. She has no quests whatsoever, um, considering she's stuck in Spellhold for 90% of the game. Uh, but her writing and personality and bants are tough to say. She actually has a lot of banter and thrown a ball with a variety of characters, and once you get her back, which I do like, I do not like her personality. I didn't like her in BG1, and she only got worse in BG2, because she spends the first 20 minutes of the game doing nothing but whining about being tortured, as if I wasn't also tortured, you know? Like, I get it, shut up, you know, just let it go. But her writing at least makes sense. There are also some fun things you can do in throwing a ball. You can convince Saravok to give, uh... You can convince Imwen to give her soul to Saravok, to Resin, and then Saravok will do all sorts of things to make fun of her for her, which is absolutely hilarious. Um, as far as her gameplay goes, she's a pure wizard. Pure wizard is one of the best classes in the game. She's dual class from a thief, so she's got a little bit of extra um, HP, a little bit better Thacko, and she can backstab, and that makes her better than just a regular plain old wizard. Also gives her some additional options for um, equipment usage, which is also great. Obviously, she doesn't get used in the item, which sucks, but... She has a lot of opportunities, a lot of tools at her disposal, which is quite nice. M1 is a perfectly good, acceptable companion. Absolutely S tier, just because wizards are so goddamn strong in this game. Uh, Nalia is a better version of M1, but not by a lot. It's just by really one item, and it's really an amazing item, but M1's perfectly great. Wizards are just too fucking good at this game. To give her A tier rating would just be doing a disservice. So... Maybe A+. Plus. Let's do that. How about that? We'll call Imwon an A-plus tier. That way she's less than Jihira, which is definitely a bit. Up next, we have Jihira. Jihira is absolutely an S-tier companion. Arguably the best tank in the game. Um, really, 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 really solid. Let me take off her equipment so I can... Oh, okay. Gonna be like that? Sure. There we go. All right. So, Jahira is a half-elf, true neutral fighter druid. She has a strength score of 15, which is dog shit. 17 dexterity, which is pretty decent. 17 con, which is also pretty decent. And dog shit, int, wisdom, and charisma. Let's be all honest here, nobody is surprised by that. Her strength is atrocious. Until Jahira gets 3 million XP and gets the Earth Elemental Transformation, giving her a strength belt is not going to allow Jahira to do any decent damage whatsoever. That being said, she already has Iron Skins, which means that, along with her Constitution and Dexterity, and the ability to wear full plate and use good armor, allows Jahira to be a very effective tank early on in the game. She can also cast Armor of the Faith, which is also extremely useful. But once you hit 3 million XP, that's when the Pandora's box really opens up on this character. But she's going to get not only the Earth Elemental Transformation, but Hardiness at the exact same time, and these two things stack. Earth Elemental Transformation gives you 50% immunity to physical damage, reduces your movement speed, replaces your weapon, and gives you 25 strength. So you hit very hard as an Earth Elemental, and you also have 50% damage reduction. So you can cast Armor of the Faith, which I should have way more memorized here. Armor of the Faith right here, giving you physical damage reduction, hardiness, and Earth Elemental Transformation. This makes you completely immune to physical damage. You literally take zero, none. Not even a one, you take zero. And that is insanely powerful, especially in throwing a ball when enemies are hitting you for 50, 75, maybe even 100 damage before mitigation, which is insane. So you give this woman some elemental resistance gear, red dragon scale, uh, helm of the rock, giving you 25% uh, resist all, a shield giving you resist all, extra fire resistance here, cloak of the lich, cold and electricity resistance, this is from Nero's quest in throwing a ball inertial barrier stuff like this and 
she's just an absolute fucking unit. As long as you have hardiness up, and let's be real, you should be putting all of your HLAs into hardiness, Jahira is almost never going to die outside of a finger of death or something like that. And as long as you have Death Ward, and as long as you're taking Impervious Sanctity of Mind, or um, Entropy Shields, which you won't get many of, because unfortunately, she doesn't unlock as a druid until very late in the game, which is absolutely tragic. You need 6 million XP in order to unlock her and get a lot of these things. So right now you just don't see shit for spell slots. But uh, once that does happen, Jahira is an absolute fucking unit, which is insane. 3 million XP opens the Pandora's box, and 6 million XP unlocks all the additional level 7 spells and what, allowing her to cast regeneration on herself, allowing her to take many entropy shields, allowing her to take multiple iron skins or insect plague, should you choose, or even chaotic commands to help buff your party members out. So she's going to hit like a truck, as long as you give her improved haste, she's going to get extra APR because she's a fighter ethos, which is awesome. Absolutely fucking awesome. Giving her like six APR, all with the Earth Elemental token. If you're giving her Righteous Magic as well, she's hitting for 35 damage every single swing while having like 200 hit points while being completely immune to physical with good elemental resistance, making her take almost no damage from magic too. And you're going to find situations where it's damn hard to kill her. And so enemies are going to be hitting her with, like, maze, imprisonment, shit like that. So that's obviously stuff you still have to worry about. But honestly, Jahira really, truly is the best tank in the game. Because unlike Herdelise, Jahira can still do this shit while fucking silenced, bro. Which is really nice. So, I mean, there obviously aren't a lot of times where that's an issue, right? Where Herdelise is, like, maybe in the Watcher's Keep and the where you can't cast magic, maybe in wild zones, or maybe there's some other bullshit going on. But the fact that she can do all this crap without casting spells at all is great. The spells just add icing on the cake. You know what I mean? Hardiness, Earth Elemental, that's all you need. 90% damage reduction. Armor of the Faith makes her completely immune. Boom. That's it. That's that. Just god tier all the way. As far as conflicts go, Jahira doesn't really have a problem with anybody. Um, although she will start shit with everybody because she's, you know, the mommy of the fucking group. Which I think is great, because I love having extra banter and writing and conversation between party members. That's the re one of the main reasons we play with a party, because it's more fun to micromanage and because they have all sorts of extra bants and shit. A romance is atrocious. I think uh, the idea of somebody who isn't even willing to gather the remains and bury her ex-husband, then wanting to jump on top of my dick less than two weeks later is extremely awkward. I am not interested in such a thing, but I do know everyone else in the world is. So, that's fine. You guys can be weird. I am judging you, however, if you try to romance Jahira. Her romance is also by far the longest in the game. It is absolutely insane just how long her romance is. It's actually pretty ridiculous to the point there. I don't think it's even possible for you to finish if, unless you're a new player who doesn't know what they're doing. If you know where to go, you can do every single quest and every area in this game and this romance will still not be done. You literally have to speed it up because it is that damn which, if you're really interested in romancing her, is nothing but a good thing. There is more writing and dialogue and conversation and fights going on in her romance than anyone else's. It's not even close. Like, you could do Hexat's romance five times and finish it before Jahira's even happy. You know what I mean? So that's kind of cool. As far as her quests go, she has a bunch. Uh, she has a lot of shit involved with Harper Hole. She has some crap with Alminster later on. She also has to uh, dip her, um, add her two cents to almost every conversation that ends up going on between other companions, between Bants and the writing. I think all that shit is great. Her personality is definitely not one that I enjoy personally, but I do think is an absolute character of a character and is great to bring around and have just because, again, she kind of pisses everyone off, so she gets pretty good marks in that regard she's arguably the best tank in the game and she's a bg1 companion so they really went all out with her as far as dialogue goes you'll notice that pretty much every bg1 companion has good quality bands and has a lot of writing because they've been around for so long they have more shit to say i like that i think that's great so almost no conflicts if not no conflicts best tank in the game bar none period fantastic at dealing damage once you get the Earth Elemental Transformation, and until you do, you can rely on bears and insects, and they carry you damn fucking fine. Her writing is pretty decent, her personality leaves something to be desired, and her romance is... Oof. It's pretty long. Pretty long. But if you like that shit, great shit. And then as far as her uh, class, or excuse me, her specific item she gets, she also gets access to the Harper pin at the end of her, uh, not the romance, but basically when her Harper hold quest finishes up. And this is amazing. 
Five Saber spell is god tier. Electrical resistance 100% is fantastic. Non detection is completely useless, and who the fuck cares about magic missile at this stage in the game? But these two things are amazing because Jahira's saves are fucking shit. So that is really, really, really nice to have. And you can get that without romancing her, by the way, as long as you finish the Harper Hold shit and you have uh, 15 reputation. If you have below 15 rep, uh, you won't get it. So keep that in mind. Oh, and although amazing character, um, very very solid pickup for pretty much any group you can imagine. Good damage, great tank, a lot of riding, a lot of bants. S tier all the way. Great companion. Up next we have my personal favorite companion, Corgan. Corgan is awesome. So Corgan is gonna have uh, decent strength of uh, I think it's 1894. Let me take off the strength belt and take a look here. Uh, 1877, excuse me, which is still fine. Uh, his dex is low, 15, 19 con. Is that right? He's got a con boost somewhere. He is 19 con. I thought he had 18 for some reason. Whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, 12 in, uh, 9 wisdom, and 7 charisma. Corrigan is a berserker, chaotic evil, dwarf, has a fuck ton of attacks per round, great Thacko. Berserking is obviously amazing. We've talked about this a million times in the past. Uh, Berserking is just absolutely fantastic an ability. Gives you a fuck ton of immunities, gives you extra HP as well. Corgan's also very versatile, and the items he can use, he starts out with Grand Mastery in a weapon, which is awesome. You can immediately put two points into dual wielding, give him Defender of East Haven in the offhand, and the man's good to start swinging. As far as weapons go, the Storm Charged Axe from uh, Chosen of Cyric is great. It's the Celestial Fury of Axes, Axe the Unyielding if you're fighting a mass group of enemies. Has a chance to decapitate on hit, which is great. Normally, you're going to be using something like Phobane or Black Razor, which on swing will heal the wielder. Phobane will actually give you an HP buffer, which is incredible. As far as other equipment goes, typically going to give them some magic resistance shit. Double fire resistance rings are great. And cloak uh, protection is fantastic, giving them extra haste. Boots of Speed, the classic Helm of the Rock. He's now completely immune to fire. And a little Seldarine for extra saves. Gauntlet's Extraordinary Specialization, maxing out his APR is good. A Bashi Hide will combine with Defender of East Haven and Hardiness, giving him a massive amount of physical damage reduction, which you're absolutely going to want and need because this man is going to take a lot of damage. Very early on in Shadows of Om, if you're playing Core Rules unmodded, Corgan makes a great tank and a great damage dealer. He can tank just fine because he's got a ton of HP. In Baldur's Gate 2, Shadows of Om, SES Insane, Corgan melts. His AC is not existent because his dex is so low. His armor, he comes with a shit, and you're going to want to dual wield with him. Capitalize on his APR. So what ends up happening, if you try to do Corgan's quest and go and fight the skeleton warriors, they'll actually kill Corgan. I've tested this myself more than once. If you send Corgan in to fight the skeletons, he won't even kill one before they both kill him. Or Thacko and damage is too high, and he literally has to run away, which is fucking embarrassing. He literally can't even do his starting quest, which is kind of hilarious, really. But, um, and that's just the way it is. This is one of the reasons I always say that you're going to want a tank character if you're playing no reload, no save, insane SES. You're going to want to have a tank. Corgan cannot do it. His only job is to pump raw physical damage, and that he excels at. Nobody else in this game, aside from, you know, your own main character that you can custom build, and compete with Corrigan when it comes to raw numbers. Anmen won't have the APR. <laughs> it's gonna say Rasad, but I mean, we don't even need to go there. Uh, Keldorn with Karsamir cannot touch Corrigan. The fact that this man can dual wield, use a variety of weaponry with improved, or excuse me, with critical strike, it's just, it. nobody comes close. Nobody comes close. If you need physical damage, Corrigan's your guy. He can do it well. He can do it better than anybody else. He also has Berserking and a fuck ton of HP. And as long as you watch him close and you have a Cleric on standby and you equip him well, he's not going to die either. And he can actually become quite tanky late TOB with the right equipment. As far as conflicts go, he will shit on Aerie hardcore um, to the point where she will eventually attack him, um, which is not a smart move on her part. I don't think he actually comes to blows with anybody else, but he picks a lot of fights with a lot of people. Um, a lot of great banter between Corrigan and especially good uh, companions. Uh, he and Vicky will go at it because they're both from the Underdark, although obviously they don't come to blows. Uh, he will hit on Mazzy constantly, which is hilarious. Um, yeah, he, he's just, as far as his bants go, Corrigan definitely 
definitely way up there. Especially if you mix them around with some good people, too. Because uh, Keldorn and Corrigan respect each other. Edwin and Corrigan respect each other. There's a lot of interesting dialogue between them that I really, really like. I think his writing is the best in the game. It's extremely appropriate and makes sense. Everything he says from start to finish is truly in line with this character and decently written and read. Uh, his conversation with Shagbag at the very beginning of his quest is absolutely hilarious. The dialogue and words they use just cracks me the fuck up to no end. Honestly, Monty is my favorite character in Baldur's Gate 1 and Corrigan's my favorite character in Baldur's Gate 1. There's nobody that I'd rather have a beer with. Super fun. Great. 10 out of 10. He does not get an S plus rating because he's definitely not the best companion. We end up finding ourselves not taking him a lot lately because we used to always take him. Corrigan was core in my runs for the longest time. And so we don't take him a lot lately. But he is an amazing companion. Highly recommended to everybody. S tier all the way. Okay. We are approaching the end here, boys. We got one more pack of five to do. And we still got to talk about Yoshimo, which we have a separate uh, save file for in uh, BG2 SOA because obviously you can't get him in throw. Up next is Jan Janssen. Jan is a chaotic, neutral, gnome illusionist thief. His stats are 9 strength, 17 dex, 15 con, 16 int, 14 wisdom, and 11 charisma. So pretty lacking across the board. He really would be great if he had one more con point. Int, wisdom, and charisma are relevant, and obviously strength's pretty relevant too. That with a belt. His dexterity is fine. He doesn't need gloves for that, which is nice. Um, Jan's pretty great. Jan was core for a long time in my runs because he's arguably the best thief in the game. Not only does his starting equipment absolutely ex fantastic, giving you physical damage reduction, which on Jan isn't great because if you're getting hit for 100 damage, this isn't going to save you. You want stone skin. But he has a lot of other equipment giving him nice boosts. His goggles give you detect illusion once per day. Excuse me. Detect invisibility once per day while giving you a bonus to detect illusions. His gloves give you a bonus to pickpocketing, etc. He just comes with all this great equipment that's absolutely amazing. And then on top of it, he's able to create the uh, bruiser mates, which early on are quite good, and then you'll never use them again. And I think the most important thing to be said about Jan is he's absolutely 100% fashion fits. Like, you look at him with his regular armor on, you think to yourself, okay, you know, he looks okay. But as soon as you give him any robe, he immediately becomes an absolute pimp. Like, you look at this man right here, like, that is quite possibly the sexiest man in the universe. This party also has Thulsa Doom in it, so that's saying something. Uh, in all seriousness, though, um, the illusionist is kind of a, an, a weak thing, to be honest. I've talked about this a lot in the class guide. Illusionist not being able to use Skull Trap or Horde Wilting is a big letdown, in my opinion. Uh, getting an extra spell per level does not make up for that in any way, shape, or form. As he is a multi-class, his wizard spells are going to take a long time. Just with Aerie, you need 3 million XP before you get level 7 spells, and that is late Shadows of Vaughn. This man doesn't see level 9 spells till very late throwing a ball, and that sucks. I guess it doesn't matter as much because he can't use Horde Wilting. Those level 8 spell slots are pretty damn irrelevant. So what you should think of Yawn as is he fulfills two roles. He is going to be your main and only thief for the game. You don't need anyone else. And he's able to cast wizard spells, which means he's going to be very tanky. He's also able to provide wizardry support by using Secret Word. Eventually, Ruby Ray, he can do some early buffing, like uh, the emotion spells, protection from fire, etc., etc. So that's typically how I like to play Yon. He's going to be using protection from petrification for myself, because this is a wild mage run. Mirror image, detect invisibility, a lot of protection from fire, AO invis, slow, stone skins, and emotion, minor globe, you know, breach, spell immunity, pretty standard shit, right? Proved taste. Protection for magical weapons. Very standard stuff here. As far as his equipment goes, I personally like to give Jan a lot of uh, rings that give him extra spells because he needs it pretty badly considering he's going to be so behind. I'm absolutely delighted to give him a lot of the uh, uh, Chosen of Sirik encounter equipment because with using the item, he can use nearly all of it. He can't use uh, Venduris' weapon because of the stat requirement, which is a shame. But uh, pretty much everything else he can use. I usually give him a robe of the evil Archimagi just because it looks cool. And also because it gives an extra save and MR. I would definitely not recommend giving him Vecna. That really should be going to your primary spellcaster, who in this run is Nalia. We'll talk about in a little bit here. But you absolutely can if you really want to. Um, he can use the Rogue's Cowl, Altars of other great equipment. Use any item is just... You can give Yon Karsamir. You can give him the Purifier. You can give him an actual helmet to make him immune to critical hits. I typically like to give him fire tooth and maybe a backstabby weapon because once you give him a strength belt, which we don't currently have equipped right now, the fact that he can spam invisibility on himself or use invisibility items, go in for a times five multiplier backstab, means Yon can actually hit pretty damn hard too. 
he can actually hit pretty damn hard in physical combat. Although I typically like to keep him as a backliner for very obvious reasons. But Jan is very versatile. Very, very versatile. He can use any item. He can start setting the uh, HLA traps for spike trap, time stop trap, which you can then use to backstab. There's just a lot of great things. Uh, a mage thief is just a really solid class all around. Illusion of Thief loses a lot of magic power, but your thief power is still not only intact, but definitely boosted by it, which is as far as his bants go, Jan is the only character in the game that I give a full 10 out of 10 for banter. Jan will have funny bants from start to finish no matter who you take. He will annoy everybody in the entire game, and it is absolutely a treat and joy to watch. I love his stories. They're ridiculous. They're nonsensical, and even gives you dialogue options to participate to piss off your party members even more. Really, really great banter and writing. His quest is pretty boring and depressing. He's basically getting cucked by some Dwergar who's banging his girlfriend that he has a crush on. Although his ending epilogue does take care of that in some way. You can't romance Jan, unfortunately, since he's currently seeing somebody. And his conflicts are, again, he doesn't really have any. Um, he basically annoys everybody, but at no point does he actually come to blows with anybody, which is kind of cool. And again, with his versatility, his banter, his writing, him being able to fill two roles of a secondary uh, spellcaster in addition to being taking care of all of your thieving abilities and problems. Jan is absolutely an S-tier companion. 10 out of 10. He used to be core in my parties for the longest time because there's so many great things you can do. You can make him just a back-of-the-line fire-tooth auto-attacker casting spells. You can make him a front-line backstabber. There's so many things you can do to play with him. Great companion all the way. And then the thing that's even more hilarious, like I said, you can give him all the paladin equipment. And then have him stand next to Mazzy and make fun of her for being a fake paladin. While Jan is wearing Karsamir and gauntlets of gloves of healing, paladin armor, and helmets. It's hilarious. Up next we have uh, Keldorn. Keldorn, I think I have... I still have him at A tier. But he is probably B plus tier, to be honest. He is uh, not all that great. A couple reasons. Uh, let me go and take off a strength build. I think he has just flat 18 strength, right? Or does he have a boot? 17, that's what I'm so Keldorn is a lawful good inquisitor, uh, 17 strength, dog shit decks of 9, 17 con, which is decent, 12 int, 16 wisdom, and 18 charisma. The last three stats is always completely used. So you're going to want to get him a strength belt ASAP. He can use Karsamir, which is great. I almost always have him using Firetooth, possibly the Purifier and Defender of East Haven as a melee combination. But typically you want to keep Keldorn away from the front line because he doesn't have a lot of HP. And unlike every other ranger, cleric, <sighs> inquisitors lose, our, uh, lose divine magic completely, which is a shame. So that means no armor of the faith on Keldorn, no divine shields, no draw upon holy might, all the really other nice shit that other classes get, Keldorn loses. And in return... He gets True Sight three times a day and Dispel Magic at, in the base game, is times two level. Which is really disgustingly good. That means a level 20, Keldorn's throwing a level 40 Dispel Magic. Which basically means that Keldorn's Dispel Magic is always, always, always going to work. Aside from the 5% chance for it not to. Which is too strong. Too strong. SES gives you the option to nerf it to one times level which makes it completely worthless because he's under the Paladin table, or 1.5 times level, which is basically on par with a Bard, which is what I used. So at 2.5 mil, he's level 16, which means his Dispel Magic is now Dispelling at level 24. I think that's fair. It's a good Dispel Magic. It's not guaranteed, but it's a pretty good solid one that'll work most of the time. That's where I think he should be. But that being said, that's kind of all he gets. Um... Which is too bad. He's a paladin, so he can't use Karsamir. He can't use the Purifier, which is great. We talked about those with Dorn. Why it sucks that Dorn can't get them. Mass Cure once per day is pretty whatever. Uh, Dispel Magic is shit, but the 30% MR is great. It's a very strong sword. You can use that with Defender of East Haven. Karsamir, 50% MR. Great weapon swap of a Fireball is coming at you. Any spell is coming at you. You can quick swap to Karsamir, and that's great. You can use Azure Edge as well, which is also handy. I will typically give him Resistance Equipment, Gift of Peace. Uh, Fur Crag's armor is great. Legacy of the Masters is fine. Amulet of Seldarine, etc., etc. Just to boost his saves and fire resistance to stop him from, you know, getting massacred. But if you tell Keldorn to walk in a melee, he's going to have a hard time, man. 
It really is. Corrigan's going to have a lot more HP and do a lot more healing. Uh, Doran's going to have a lot more damage reduction. Even Minx is going to have more damage reduction. Um, although have less HP because it's fucking Minx, right? Um, Valigar is going to be better. You really... It, it, again, this is the problem we talked about before. Keldoran can't tank. He's not going to be doing that great of physical damage. He can't cast any magic aside from his innate spells of True Sight and Dispel. So what role does he really fill in the party, you know? He doesn't do anything. He's not good at anything. And that's where it becomes awkward to find places for him. On top of that, he actually has a lot of conflicts too. He can't play with Hexad at all. And that's a shame because I really want to do a no arcane run and the only non-arcane thief in the game is Hexad. And if you don't have arcane magic, you want somebody to dispel and you can't take them both together, which sucks. He also has problems with Animan if he fails his trials. Um, he has some problems with Keld or with the uh, Edwin, although again, I don't ever see that happening. Um, he has problems with Vicky. They will come to blows and kill each other. He will also attack you at times, uh, based on a variety of triggers and based on your reputation. He'll just literally say, I see the evil growing within you, my friend. I can stand idly by no longer and just drop party and attack you right then and there. So there's a lot of things that Keldoran has going against him that is kind of unfortunate. And again, in the base game, Keldoran's probably the most overpowered companion. Just because dispel magic at twice level when enemy wizards aren't throwing up protection from uh, spell immunity, uh, you pretty much just throw that out and him along with Surin take the cake for being just disgustingly overpowered. Surin throws out Creeping Doom, Keldoran throws out the spell magic and you just auto win the fight. You know what I mean? Just GG, you win. GG, easy. But with SES, Ascension, Insane, Keldoran's too squishy to front line. You can kind of try to position him behind somebody with Karsamir, but what, you end up having to reposition so damn often that Keldorn's going to have to run away at some point. Typically, when I play Keldorn for 90% of the game, he's in the back with fire, honestly. And he's just a dispel magic thrower. And that's not really all that fun to play. As far as his writing goes, I think his writing is great. It's just like every other paladin I've ever met in Baldur's Gate, he's extremely bloodthirsty, which I fucking love. I love bloodthirsty paladins. When Vicky's about to get burned, he's cheering it on. Yeah, burn the drow. Anytime you kill a buttload of drow or orcs, he's like, ah, that feels great. You know, he's just absolutely hilarious in that regard. I think his writing is pretty good. He does have some decent banter. Doesn't have too much going on. His quest is hilarious to me. Um, his wife is seeing somebody, and so you can get to throw his wife in prison and have the other dude executed, and he just becomes absolutely despondent. And it's just hilarious. I absolutely love it because I'm an evil dude and I like my party to be evil. Um, you can also have a good ending where you can literally... Re well, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but you know what I mean. There's some interesting shit to do with this quest, which I like. Um, he does have a lot of conflicts. Uh, his writing is pretty good. His bants are okay. Not as many as other characters, but they're pretty decent when they do happen. But I think his writing is good. His class is crap. His stats are pretty underwhelming. The equipment he comes with is okay. His armor gives him free action. It's a full plate plus one. And he has the Hollowed Redeemer where every time he gets hit, the enemy takes a little bit of damage. That's a lot better in the base game when you're not getting hit for 50 damage a swing. So the damage you're doing back is pretty damn decent. But what he has here, not all that great. The fact that he's good means he can't use the Man Coat or uh, Doran's Dragon Armor, which is really good. So all in all, he's really a B-plus tier character. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I just can't have him at A. He's B+, plus because why would you play Keldorn when you can take, you know, Hair Lease or something like that? You know what I mean? So, B+. Plus. Up next, we have Nalia. Uh, Nalia is one of my favorite companions. She's basically the exact same thing as Emma, and their stats are extremely similar. Uh, Nalia has a slightly higher strength score. She still has the same constitution and dexterity rating and intelligence rating. All three of these are identical between the two of them. They're both thieves that have dual class to a mage. However, Nalia did it sooner. So that means her backstab multiplier is only times two, and it also means her thieving levels are lower. So you're going to want some items if you want to boost her thieving levels to be on par. But just like Emelyn, she's still capable of going in for the occasional backstab. She still is capable of being your uh, pure wizard, um, your primary spellcaster, though again, she's not going to do it nearly as well as Edwin and uh, Nira. Uh, I'd personally like to give her short bow guessing. In this party, she's our only caster, so she's got Vecna on. Otherwise, you'd be giving her another robe. Circlet and Ethereal, which is giving her extra spells. Amulet of Power, which further increases her spell casting speed. And then here's what makes Nalia so fucking good, in my opinion, compared to M1, is her Signet Ring. 
This not only gives her plus two saves and armor, so it's a plus two ring of protection, but it also has Battleista's passport built into it, giving her 50% fire resistance. And this is fucking incredible. If you cast protection from fire on yourself or give yourself another fire resistance ring or on some other equipment, Nalia is now being healed by fire damage unbuffed, which is amazing. Or you can just do protection from fire, and now she's getting healed by fire damage, which is awesome. Fire is the most common source of elemental damage in this game by far. Dragon's Breath and Comet both do fire damage and both hit for devastating amounts of damage when you're taking double damage. So having good fire resistance is great, and having that built in to a plus two, plus two ring is awesome. Really, really, really good. As for a spell selection, it's going to be basically the same as M1. It just really depends on what you're doing. If you have a primary spellcaster, they should be doing primarily offensive shit, and then this character should be doing primarily defensive shit or buffing purposes. Protection from fire being thrown out, maybe invisibility on herself, or party members for backstabs, you know, maybe some of the emotion spells, maybe imp haste to buff the group, etc., etc., things like that. It really just depends on what you're doing with your build. If she's going to be more offensive, um, if she's your primary caster, take her skull traps, horde wiltings, etc., etc., etc. All in all, though, Nalia has great. Her writing is hilarious. Nalia is the very coddled, stuck-up, naive, rich kid who has no idea what she's saying or doing, which is hilarious. I love that shit. I know a lot of people don't. I think... Her writing is great. I think her bants are funny as hell, especially when everyone else keeps trying to tell her that she's an idiot and doesn't know what she's talking about, and she just double downs every time, and I just fucking love that. It's great. Unfortunately, you can't romance Drew Barrymore here, um, and her only quest is really the Diarnest Keep, and after that's done, it's over and done with. Uh, one thing to note, if you did not know, if you have her in the party when you do the Diarnest Keep, She'll give you an extra 10,000 gold. If you don't, then you don't get that gold at all. As far as conflicts go, I don't think she has conflicts with anybody. Although I'm not 100% on that. I'm fairly certain she's cool with everybody. Although she might give uh, Hexat or some other people get at some point. I do know her bants with Corian are great. I do know her bants with Keldorn and Animan are amusing. Jahira and other people try to set her straight all the time. And she's just absolutely adamant in her ways. I love Nolly. I think she's great. But I do know a lot of people that really don't like that. But the fact is, she's a thief who is dual to mage. She can do the thieving things. She can also be a great spellcaster. And then on top of it, her signet ring is stellar. In my opinion, she's better than Emma Wynn. Um, Just because of the ring, although M1 does get better thieving scores and an extra one times multiplier on backstab. So it really depends on what you're looking for there. But she's a great pickup. Absolutely S tier just because wizards are so goddamn good in this game. But I think her bands are also really good. And her writing is really good. Up next, we have Minx. Minx is absolute shit. Um, I think I ended up putting him at B tier, because I feel like he is better than Rasad. I can take my list here. I am C plus. Okay, that makes more sense. So he is better than Rasad, but not by fucking much. So Minx is unfortunately a pure ranger, which is absolutely tragic. Until Monks came out, rangers were by far the worst class in the game. Um... He has a decent strength score of 1893, but again, who cares in BG2? There are a billion belts to boost your strength. Dexterity is 16. Okay, not bad. Missing two AC there. Constitution is 16, and that's really fucking tragic. And then the rest of his scores are just absolute dog shit, but who the hell cares because that shit's irrelevant anyway. Minx does come with Boo, which is great, because you can click him and he goes squeak, which is really nice. Um, typically, what happens when you play Minx is you really want to build him as a flail of the age. Um, Play of the Ages, Timothy Vsaven, Armor of the Faith, Hardiness uh, player. He's not going to be able to compete with Corrigan for damage. He's not going to be able to compete with Jihara for tankiness. He and Valigar are going to be something in between, just like Dorne, where they're going to be able to put out good damage. They're going to be able to do good tanking eventually. And that's basically it. So by giving the man a Bashi hide, which is great, Defender of Vsaven, Hardiness, and using Flail of the Ages, rotating that with Fobane. Minx is going to be able to stay alive despite having dog shit HP, as long as you give him a decent collection of elemental resistance crap, whatever you have left. Um, Minx will be able to stay alive fairly well. The problem is, until you get all this crap, which is going to be late in, you know, SOA, early TOB, Minx is a squishy motherfucker. He has less than 100 hit points in the starting dungeon, and that is painful when shit hits as hard as it does on insane damage SCS. His Berserker Rage is also garbage. It is not the same as Corrigan's Berserking. It is not the same as Barbarian Rage. It is unfortunate, honestly. 
It's kind of unfortunate. So all these things combined with a stat roll means he just doesn't really have a lot going for him. You can give him a couple Armor of the Fates here. Don't forget that uh, Rangers get Druid spells, not Cleric spells. So he does not get Draw Upon Holy Might like Dorn does. He does not get Recitation like Dorn does. He does not get Protection from Evil like Dorn does. And he does not get Divine Shield like Dorn does. And that sucks. He does get Call Lightning. But just like all Rangers and Paladins, for those who don't know, the way it works is that when you hit level 9 as a Ranger or a Paladin, you then become basically a level 1 Cleric. So if you're a level 20 Paladin casting Draw Upon Holy Might, you're not casting Draw Upon Holy Might as a level 20 Paladin. You're casting it as a level 11 Cleric, which sucks. So that means spells that are based on level, such as damaging spells, or buff spells that don't have a fixed duration don't do that much damage. So Mix, yeah, will get Call Lightning in late TOB, but this is doing the same as Jahira would at the start of SOA. You see what I'm saying? It's like Jahira at the start of Shadows of Om has the same Call Lightning as Minx in early Throne of Ball. And that is kind of painful, bro. And he only cast it once, right? Because he doesn't get a lot... Well, I don't know what level he is. He's probably, what, 2.5? Yeah. So this is, you know, very late SOA shit. Um, obviously, he will get more spell levels. The shit will get higher. But, like, he's a level 16 ranger right now. That means Call Lightning's casting at level 7. And that sucks, man. That really, really, really sucks. So you combine the fact that Druid spells are not as good as Paladin spells. Or, excuse me, um, ranger spells because their druid spells are not as good as paladin getting cleric spells for uh, the fighter ethos. They're just not as good. Draw upon Holy Might is great. They both get Armor of the Faith, which is great, but paladins just get better shit, period, flat out. He has less constitution than Dor... Oh, well, he, he and Dorn are basically the same constitution. But he's got less than Valigar. He's got less than Corgan. He's got less than Jahira. He's got less than all the other people who are able to do the exact same thing he can, but better. Valigar is going to do his job better. Dorn is going to do his job better. Caldorn won't. Minx is going to be better than that. He's also going to do a better job than Rasad. He's going to be tankier. But again, this man is squishy for a long fucking time. Getting Defender of East Haven early does not stop Minx from being squishy. He needs Hard Eagles. He needs Defender of East Haven. He needs, excuse me, Armor of the Faith. He needs a Bashi Hide. He needs all this shit. Oh my god, I can't stop burping. I'm so sorry. He needs all this shit to stay alive when you're taking double damage. He really, truly does. So you want to give him a good resistance helmet, good resistance rings, good AC armor, um, good resistance shit, just across the board, and then combined with the physical damage reduction shit. And if you give all this crap to Minx, what the fuck else is the rest of your party going to use? You need to go so hard on keeping this man alive that the rest of your party is like, okay, well, Minx is good now, but... What the fuck am I going to wear, bro? You know what I mean? And that's why you end up... It's frustrating. I, I truly believe that until Rasad was added to the game, that Minx, until the enhanced edition, I firmly believe that Minx was the worst companion in the game by far. It was not even close. By far, Minx was a worse companion than everyone else. And now that Rasad's here and Wilson's here, Minx isn't the worst, but he's still damn close. As far as conflicts go, I'm pretty sure uh, he still has a conflict with Edwin, although I'm confident with High Charisma that can be avoided. I've played with them both at the end of the game with High Charisma without them bitching. Um, I have believe he has problems with Hexat, although I'm not 100%. I think he's cool with everybody else. I do know he has great lines and great banter. Uh, Minx has a lot of lines in this game for very obvious reasons. He's basically the icon of Baldur's Gate at this point, so he has a buttload of dialogue, a buttload of great banter with other companions. Boo is great. And uh, for that, I, that alone, I think Minx is worth several playthroughs um, with a bunch of different companions. He's unromanceable. Um, but I do think, like I said, his writing and bants are really solid, and I think that's what saves him as a companion. The point where I have taken Minx in the past because I need him, and I don't hate every second of the way because his lines are so amusing at times. He's really really enjoyable, especially if you take Jan and some of the older NPCs like uh, Edwin or Jahira, Imwin, etc, etc. They really go at it. It's really, really fun and enjoyable. So for that reason, he gets a C+. He's definitely better than Rasad. 
but the amount of time, the amount of work that goes into keeping him alive, chances are, if you take Minx with you, he's going to get permit before throwing a ball, unless you're really, really good. Also, uh, I think his, uh, his uh, racial enemy is Vampire? Yeah. His racial enemy is Vampire. I forgot to mention that, because that actually is kind of important. Um, who cares? Uh, honestly, uh, you encounter Vampires a couple times in SOA. You encounter them while clearing Bodhi's Lair both times. You encounter them in Windspear Hills. You encounter them once and throwing a ball, and then uh, just a couple ambushes a night, and then you'll never see them again forever. Which sucks, in my opinion. That really, 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 truly sucks. Um, because the racial enemy bonuses are not inconsequential. Fourth echo and four damage is quite a lot. Now, that's pretty damn good. But he did not pick a good enemy for it. Tragic. But to be fair, I mean, Valigar didn't pick an amazing one either. He picked golems. And most golems are going to be having such high damage reduction that those bonuses are completely inconsequential. So, we'll talk about Valigar in a second. Basically, when I pick Ranger, I almost always do Fell, or excuse me, a uh, demonic or draconic, just because you end up fighting so many demons in OB, and you fight quite a few dragons too, actually. But um, all in all, C plus tier, better than Rasad, but not great. His bants and writing are good though. Up next is Hair Elise. Hair Elise is a very close second to being the best tank of the game, right behind Jahira. Exceptionally good companion. Um, he is a Tifling blade, which is interesting. Let me take off. Of this, I believe he has 17 strength, right? Yeah, 17 strength, 17 dex, 9 constitution, and so its con is very low. This is the character you really want to give the con belt to, along with Airy. Int of 15, 13 wisdom, and 16 charisma. But what a lot of people don't know, however, is that Tiflings, for some weird reason, actually have base resistances. Um, Herdalise actually has uh 50% cold resistance, 25% fire, and then 15% physical resistance. Just innately by being a Typhling. So that automatically happens and comes with. Which is kind of cool. That's kind of cool. And a lot of people don't know that. He also has hidden bonuses to using short swords as well. Although those are pretty inconsequential. You really don't want to be using short swords on Herolese. We'll talk about his equipment in a minute. But basically, blades and bards in general should be played like a tank in Baldur's Gate 2. They have a decent amount of spells, not a ton, but a decent amount. The remove magic is very good because their levels, they level up very quickly and they will be higher than any other wizard in the game by far. You can uh, see that at 4 million XP, if you were a wizard at this level, you'd probably be about 21, maybe 20. Uh, he is almost level 30, which is insane. So his dispel magic is going to be very high. Do keep in mind that there aren't many spells that scale past 20, but there are some that work that do. If you're playing in the original game, Skull Trap is capped at 30, which means Herdalise can do a 30 D6 Skull Trap long before any other wizard in your party is capable of doing so, which is amazing. But I typically play him as a tank. Um, for main hand, I almost always use Chrome Fair. Of all the characters in the game, Cromfair is best used on a bard by far for a couple of reasons. One, clerics are going to be able to boost their strength to 25 anyways. They don't need it. Fighters are going to have better equipment to use, such as Fobane, um, Black Razor, possibly Flail of the Ages. Uh, thieves can't use it at all, you know, because they're fucking thieves. And um, who else is going to use it? You know what I mean? Like, really. You, if you really think about it, nobody else can really use Cromfair. But bards can. And bards have a shitty base stacko because they're on the thief table. So getting 25 strength is actually pretty damn good. It's really important for a bard. So he uses that for his main hand. Always Kundane for the offhand. You should never ever take this off. He has additional bonuses for using the short sword. And he needs the extra APR badly because he's limited to one APR normally. As far as rings go, I always recommend the reaching ring and the ring of acuity. Giving them extra spells. Uh, giving him Dakon Zerthblade early on is also quite decent because it's a plus two katana. And he can only put one point in shit, so you can actually get a variety of weapons uh, memorized and used. You can give him Axe the Unyielding because he gets to use any item as well. You can also give him uh, Azure Edge or Mace Disruption as needed to deal with Undead. Bards really have a lot of versatility in this game as far as weaponry goes because you can get so many proficiency points. But Cromfair is definitely the best. As far as armor goes, he's currently using Drow Chainmail. This is the one... From Joe's Nasir, giving you 5% MR and 1 improved spellcasting speed. There's a variety of things you can boot, put here. I usually recommend something with resistances. We have the Paladin Bracers giving him extra HP because, again, using the item allows him to use anything. And he has Helmet Brilliance, which is an absolutely fantastic helmet, giving him 40% uh, fire resistance and immunity to critical hits. And the Wooden Horse Necklace from Quest. So, 
Um, the other thing I always want to say is always have Valor's Helm and Herdalise's inventory ready to go. In a fight, you should immediately pop Valor's Helm, use your simulacrum, and have it go stand in the corner and dance. While it's dancing, the improved Bard Song is giving everyone in your party a massive, massive combat boost. And you don't want Herdalise to do this. If you do have the Bard Hat, I definitely recommend using it. Because it allows the uh, song to last for an extra two rounds after you stop. So you can easily swap the hat mid-combat to another helmet or something else that you want to use instead. Giving them the, uh, the extra HP and Thaco helmet. Uh, the Ion Stone that we used earlier is also very, very good early on. But really, I play Herdalise like a tank. I give him Mirror Image. I give him Stone Skin. I give him Protection from Magical Weapons. And I have him go into the middle of the fight and start soaking fire. I have the the Valor Helm thing standing behind him and dancing. And sometimes I'll have Herdalise use Defensive Stance, although not often because it roots him in spot. And all these things combined to make Herdalise pretty much invincible. He's going to be taking very little damage, if any at all, between the combination of spell immunities and all the other spells he can get. His AC should be boosted to the roof with improved invisibility, spirit armor, the bard song, etc., 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 meaning it's almost impossible to hit him when without critical strike you'll pretty much never get hit, which is great. And then he's also able to do fairly decent damage because of Cromfair boosting his Thacko high enough to where he can more reliably hit shit. You'll notice his Thacko is way lower than some of the others. Animan, Corgan, Mazzy, uh, all these other people are going to be having Thacko well above, excuse me, I should say well better than negative 10. This man is a negative 2 unbuffed, which is tragic. But again, once you start buffing and once you start, you know, using other equipment and crap, you'll be able to get that Thacko up to a decent number where he will be reliably hitting enemies, which is good. So absolutely amazing tank, Juggernaut for sure. Um, he's able to provide mage support, especially early on. Um, once you get him a couple items to give him some extra spells, this is typically what I use. Fuck ton of mirror images, a couple blurs, protection from petrifications, couple protection for buyers to cast on the party, remove magic, stone skins, etc, etc. Fuck ton of spell immunities, protection from, uh, magical weapons, etc, etc. If you have improved spell cast, you can take 7 and 8 spells, although I don't typically use them for very obvious reasons, because we don't always like and use that component anyways, but, yeah. Pretty damn solid. As far as his banter goes and writing goes, I think his writing is very amusing at times. Um, his way with words is very interesting. I think if you ignore the fact that some of his dialogue with Aerie is so fucking cringy, he's actually very worth it to bring along. He picks, uh, he has some great bands with Jahira at times, annoys her a lot. Jan annoys the hell out of him, which is hilarious. Herdalise has some good writing and some good bands. Again, aside from the, the Aerie romance. His quest, the only one he has is the one in Trade Me. Or excuse me, um, the one in um, the Five Flagons Inn where you do his quest to save him from the uh, planar prison. And then after that, you don't have to worry about any extra crap there. His gameplay is very solid. Great tank. Decent damage. He's going to be definitely on the low side because he's missing APR and Thacko. But he can still put out some numbers and his tanking is second only to Jahira's. This is a man that can stay in the front line of combat, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Furcrag for a very long time. And you don't have to worry about him dying any fucking time soon. Because again, all his spells are going to be lasting longer very, very early on. Which is great. Because almost every spell scales with level. Which is really nice. And his levels are going to be very high very early on. And then of course, once he gets his uh, <clears throat> use any item, he can use any item in the game. You can give him quick swaps for Karsamir, stuff like that. You can have him set time stop traps or uh, spike traps. I mean, bards just have a lot of versatility in this game. They really just do. Even without the bard song. And then when you add that into it, it's like, okay. Very solid companion. S tier all the way. Can't say enough good things about it. All right, we only got two left, boys. Oh, now we actually have to go back to Shadows of Om now. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Load. Uh-oh. I had a save file here with uh, Valigar and Yoshimo to talk about, and now they're gone. Oh, here they are. Cool. Nice. It was there. I'm, I'm just blind because I couldn't see Yoshimo. Uh, up first, we have Yoshimo. Um, this is kind of a shame of a character. He is a human bounty hunter, true neutral, 17 strength, which is great for a thief. Highest in the game of all thieves by far. Uh, 18 dexterity, which is great. 16 constitution, which is perfect. Um low end wisdom and charisma but who cares about those three these are the first three stats that matter and they're actually fantastic 
He's actually high enough to dual class to a fighter if he wants to, which is cool. The Bounty Hunter is a very unique kit that's fun to play because you still get backstabs and you get spicy traps. He has no points in set traps whatsoever, which is fucking embarrassing for a Bounty Hunter and doesn't make any sense, but that's what, you know, Bioware started to go with. I almost said that's what Blizzard did, but it's not Blizzard's fault. This one's Bioware's. His bant is great. He has a lot of great banter with a lot of companions. His personality is fantastic. I think his writing is good. And then you get halfway through the game and he gets permanently killed off. Spoiler alert. And it's a shame because I actually really, really like his dialogue. His dialogue is a lot of fun. He has a lot of writing and a lot of dialogue between all the NPCs in the game. His character is really interesting. I would love to take him further, especially because you can dual class him too. And you don't have any other thieves in this game who don't use arcane magic aside from Hexad. And it's a goddamn shame. He also has no conflicts. There's really not much to say about him. You can't take him with you. Halfway through the game, he dies. As far as building him goes, you can clearly see he's naked. Doesn't really matter, because he's gonna fucking die at some point, and then you replace him with Emwin or whoever else. I typically don't play with Yoshimo at all, because every XP point he gets is technically wasted, because once he's removed from the party, all that XP kind of goes to rot. It's a shame. I do think his storyline with Irenicus in Spellhold could leaves a lot to be desired, but I do believe everything up to that is actually quite fun and quite worth it. His stats are great, his class is good. Um, it's really a shame. As far as build goes, I'd give him a good leather armor. He can't use a helmet, he'll never get one. Um, he'll die before you get anything useful. Um, you give him an iron stone, I guess, and protection rings. He won't get a resistance ring in time. It's, there's really not much to say about him, to be honest. It's kind of sad. I, I I almost didn't plan on saying anything about him and Clara at all, just because uh, Clara I'm not even gonna bother talking about. It. I don't give a shit about her. But Yoshimo is absolutely worth taking 100% for his dialogue alone. In my opinion, there is no character that should be taken once more than Yoshimo. I think all the lines he has with all the NBCs and Athkadla and the bants with your characters and all the other shit he brings to the table is just so good and so worth it that i highly recommend taking with you at least once that being said there's no real reason to ever take him again unless you just really like his personality and his lines or you're playing a mod that stops him from dying or doing some other imprisonment bullshit trick to prevent him from dying which you can do but he is absolutely an rp tier companion for those reasons and i'd love to talk more about him but again, you just, there's really nothing you could do. You can imprison him and free him later, and that will prevent him from dying in Spellhold. There's mods to make him playable. You can save him. There's a quest you can do with him where um, you take his heart to a, te a priest in a temple of Ogma to reduce the Gaius, and he doesn't go to suffer a horrific fate and whatever hell awaits him. So that's nice, but at the end of the day, RP's here all the way. And finally, we have everyone's favorite Vin Diesel impersonator, Valigar Cortala, who is a neutral good human stalker. Decent strength of 17, doesn't really matter since you're going to boost that anyways. Dexterity of 18, unfortunately he's only 16 con. As a fighter ethos, you want that to be higher. Uh, 10 int, 14 wisdom, and 10 charisma. He is a stalker, so that means he is going to be able to backstab to a maximum of times 4 at 17, which is cool. His racial enemy is Golem, so every Golem in the game will get an additional 4th Akko and 4 damage to. Just like Minx, this is kind of irrelevant. Although there are definitely more Golems in this game than Vampires, since almost all of them have damage reduction, if not being outright immune to the weapons you're using like some of them do. Um, that damage in Thacko bonus is pretty fucking useless. But, uh, you know, at least you'll see Golems in TOB, unlike Vampires. But you can absolutely do go all of throwing a ball without seeing a single one of them. Um, as far as his equipment goes, he actually starts off with great armor. This is one of the only NPCs in the game who I actually recommend keeping their starting equipment. His armor gives him immunity to charm, 25% resistance to fire and acid, and 25% magic damage resistance. And this is slightly misleading for people who are new to this game. Um, or are confused by this, this does not mean if someone throws a fireball at you, you take 25% less damage from it. This means magic missile, force missiles, horde wilting, shit that does raw magic damage. This does not reduce all of magic damage. This is just if someone uses a spell at you, if it's not doing elemental damage, this will reduce it. Fire resistance will help with fireball. This does not help with fireball. And this armor is great. 
Its AC is pretty underwhelming, which is only two. He also can't use the main coat because he's good, which sucks. But, you know, this is still fairly decent. Still fairly decent. When I play Valigar, I typically like to use him as a backstab opener. So I'll backstab with Celestial Fury, and then he'll start using Flail of the Ages and Defender of East Haven. And that, along with Hardiness and Armor of the Faith, and uh, all these other cool equipment, um, will basically keep him up. But again, with Minx, just like with Minx, Valigar is pretty damn squishy early on, and you've really got to watch him and really got to be careful. But if you always keep in mind that he's starting off with a backstab, you're going to be microing him anyways. So you can usually get him in a decent position, unlike Minx, where you may not be thinking about that in his stealth is also very good. For some dumb reason, um, Stalkers get a surprisingly decent amount of fucking stealth in this game. At level 8, with only 300k XP, he's already at 100-100. You go and level him up here. Um, he's now 134-29, which is fucking incredible. And then if you go and give him some stealth boots, some other equipment, you can boost him up rapidly, very quickly. As far as the rest of his gear goes, I recommend giving him whatever elemental resistance crap you can afford. You know, Gift of the Peace... Amulet of Seldarine, maybe. Battlista's Revenge. Something like that. You can't really use Ring of Protections with a Court Hall of Family Armor unless you want to give him an axe. If you want to, go for it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, unfortunately, the best item from SOD Forum, the Stalker's Gauntlets, do not transfer armor, which is a big shame. His Backset Multiplier also levels up very slowly compared to a Thief. Uh, keep in mind, he's basically 3 million XP in SOA before his backstab multiplier is actually max, and it's times 4, not times 3. But the fact that he gets specialization um, and extra APR means that after the backstab, unlike a thief who has to run away, Valigar can actually stay there in melee, which is quite good. As far as damage goes, not going to be as good as Corrigan. As far as tanking goes, he's not going to be as good as Jihira. Just like Minsk and Dorn, he's kind of that in-between guy. Where he's able to use Flail of the Ages, he's able to use Defender of East Haven, Armor of the Faith, and Hardiness to smack up to have a good AC, or excuse me, a good amount of damage reduction, and he's able to do good damage, but he's not excelling at either. But as long as you have somebody who can tank, as long as he's not your only damage dealer, Valigar is a fantastic character. As far as his writing goes, I'm actually practically in love with the dude. He literally starts to whine once in this game and then immediately cuts himself off by saying, hey, you don't want to listen to my problems. And I'm like, you know what? You're absolutely right. I don't want to listen to your problems. Thank you so much for shutting up. I love it that he does that, unlike everyone else who has no problem whining to you for hours at, at a time about my wings or my dead husband or boo, 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 boo. I love that shit. Lavok's quest is actually interesting. I like Lavok. A lot of fun. He has decent bands with several companions. His writing is really great from start to finish, honestly. He's only got a couple conflicts, Hexat and uh, Vicky, to my knowledge. And again, the Vicky one can be avoided as long as you don't talk to the NPC. And I think his gameplay is pretty great. Honestly, I think Valigar is a really solid companion. I'm going to give him an A-plus rating. He definitely does not deserve S-tier, but he is damn close to it, in my opinion. Really, really fun character. He has absolutely grown on me an awful lot since uh, the last time we played with him. So, really, really solid for sure. As far as the spells go, you basically want to play him the same way Doran does. Armor of the Faith, drop on Holy Might. Oh, wait, that's right. He's a stalker. He doesn't get drop on Holy Might. Armor of the Faith is the only one that really matters. Um, everything else for these is just pretty fucking irrelevant. Whatever you want to use, you can take. It doesn't really matter because the spells at 2, 3, 4 are just such atrociously bad. If you're playing with expanded spell progression, that means he does get Iron Skin at level 5, which is pretty damn nice, especially considering, unlike a Druid, he doesn't get locked at that crappy level 14 garbage that they do, so it actually will scale decently eventually and throw in a ball, which is good, but that's pretty much it. All in all, good companion, definitely not great, but very solid pickup for sure. And uh, that is going to wrap it up here, boys. I'm praying to God I didn't miss anybody, because if I did, I'm going to be really fucking depressed. If you disagree with me, let me know in the comments. Let me know what your favorite character is. Uh, don't like, don't subscribe. Uh, definitely don't fucking subscribe, because I'll be honest, it's going to be another 10 years before I upload another video. Let's be real here. I'll try to do more, but uh, let's be honest, it's not going to happen anytime soon, because... It happens in life, boys. But I really appreciate you guys tuning in and watching. And remember, my dudes, no matter whatever happens in life, you're the best there ever was and ever will. I love you, and God loves you, and you could do anything in life, dudes, and don't you ever forget it. And I'm going to say this one more goddamn time because I know someone's going to get pissed off and type in the comments. 
and mauled so hard. Every single companion in this game is viable. It doesn't matter who you take and use. We'll be able to kill a Melisande on no save, no reload, insane ascent. But you're going to have a bad time if you're taking this. That's all I'm saying. Thanks again for watching, dudes. Peace out and God bless. We'll see you next time.